All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Mike o Geeky Podcast, Monday night, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, here and in Ecuador uh, tonight. Oh, by the way, in case you don't know, I'm Mike O'Geeky. Uh, tonight, we're going to hang out with a, a bunch of people. I think, I think we got, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight, nine people possibly showing up for the party tonight. So, uh, but first, ladies first, we're going to have on the show uh, Mandy Quark. She is down in Ecuador right now on uh, on a foray uh, with Alan Rockefeller and uh, a, a, a bunch of mycologists, a bunch of field mycologists, a bunch of uh, people who uh, decided they were going to drop everything and cruise down to Ecuador and roam around the jungles looking for who knows what, who knows what they're going to find this week. It's going to be cool. It's going to be fungal. Might be some snakes, I don't know, lizards, monkeys. I fully expect a monkey by Thursday. We'll see what happens. <clears throat> anyway, uh, and, and then uh, after we get done talking to Mandy, we're going to uh, bring on a bunch of newbies, a bunch of new growers, people who have been cultivating for a, a year or less, and we're just going to see what life's like in the newbie scene. Uh, and, and then when we get done doing that, we're going to you know cruise over with Ed, and we're going to talk some... We're going to probably get a little more science-y tonight than we usually do. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, wood lover's paralysis. Uh, there's some, some new talk uh, about it, and uh, Ed's going to chime in kind of on a chemistry level. And uh, I believe I got Dr. Rick showing up tonight. Um, so he, he'll kind of hit the neuropharmacology of it all. Uh, so anyway, it should be a good night. Um, but let's get right into it right now. Latin America, way down south, guys, way down south. Ecuador, Ecuador, we're going there. Let's, let's see if we got her. Let's see what she's doing. What do you guys think she's doing right now? I don't know. She's probably like wrestling a zebra. Do they have zebras in Latin America? I don't know. We're going to find out. Hold on. All right. Welcome to the show, the one and only Mandy Quark. What's up, Mandy? Yeah, I just got finished wrestling with Zebra, you know. You won, right? You yeah, won. they imported it here just for me. like. Perfect. <laughs> I mean, that is a selling point. When I'm on Airbnb looking for uh, resorts in Ecuador, I, I have to click the Zebra Wrestling tab. Right? That is so, very important. You got to come to Finca High Matlos, bro. This is like, everybody showed up today and they were like, yo, this is the Glamazon. Like, this is, like, it's, like, the glamorous Amazon, like, for real. Oh, like, yeah. it's super nice. You can walk right down the hill into the Amazon jungle, and, like, you have, you're on 3G. And then wow. you come back to the hill, and you get a drink, and you, like, sit in the hot tub. Amazon 3G. Not 5G, but, you know, you're in the Amazon. 3G. That's still good. I, mean, I did not know the Amazonians had 3G. <laughs> I am surprised. The Ecuadorian Amazon does. Well, it's I like, guess. it's right here. It is, isn't that really funny, though? Like, I was like, oh, I'm definitely yeah. going to have to have Wi-Fi. And we were worried about doing this podcast. It was rescheduled. And it was like, oh, am I going to have Wi-Fi? But it's Wi-Fi is amazing. You got strong. it. <laughs> like, it's great. Um, well, it's great for you because you guys are, you're able to be down there. You've been down there a couple weeks already. And right. you're able to upload, you know, your, I know you're stacking photos. When you guys are not hunting in the woods, I know you're back home stacking photos and, and, and we we've already seen some of them so uh yeah. if you didn't have the internet you wouldn't be able to do any of that stuff it's true and like yeah. also i naturalist like so just putting our cell phone photos up you know right right there ready to go getting it up like getting all that out yeah and there's so much crazy stuff that we've seen that i haven't even had time to stack because i still have two other jobs other than right. this so I'm... Um, and you got to do your job. Yeah. I, I mean, these job. days, not everybody feels that way, but I know you do. You got to do your job. Well, they're both like mushroom-related jobs, so that's just really lucky. Um, that's good. Yeah, so so let's, let's do this. With everybody I have on, I, I really like to hear the Myco origin story. Like, what is your earliest mushroom memory? When was the first time when you said, oh, I think I like mushrooms? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I always, I approached it from a very theoretical standpoint, 
So okay. my first mushroom when I was like, wow, but thank you. Oh, look at this. Thank you. Gracias. They just gave me this. It, really great drink. I can already taste that. That looks scrumptious. Yeah. Strawberry juice. Um, you guys are really roughing it down there, I can tell. I <laughs> Straight up strawberry juice, bro. Oh, Ecuadorian wow. strawberry. Um, yeah, but um, so I was in, so I graduated with my master's degree in 2014 from mm -hmm. the University of Sciences. And when I was there, um, I got... I was like, just, okay. I was like, I need to think of a topic for like a thesis. And I was like going back and forth. I didn't know what to pick. And then I was like in my professor's office and he was a pharmacognosy researcher. So it's like natural product medicines. Okay. So he was like a pharmacognosy expert, you know, like he was, he was really old actually, but he, he was super cool. He got, this magazine called the herbal gram, which is just a popular magazine amongst like herbalists and stuff. Okay. And there was this Paul Stamets article in the herbal gram. And on the front of it, it was a beautiful, gorgeous photo of a reishi mushroom. And I was just like, Oh my God. I was like, what? Is, first of all, what is that? Like I didn't know what it was. Um, and then like, second of all, I like open up to the article and it was like all this medicinal properties of reishi mushrooms. And I was like, Whoa, this is really cool. Like I can do this for and, my thesis. And then you took the 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 magazine, you turned it sideways, and then the reishi centerfold pulled out, <laughs> and you were like, "Look at that reishi." Woo! That would have been hot. So so much <laughs> metabolic pathway action going on. You don't know where to begin. Yeah, that would have been really hot. That would have been really yes, sexy. like a three-page spread. Yeah. Yes, sexy. like big <laughs> antler spread. Oh yes. Yeah. Definitely nice. with like you know some wet exudates on there, yeah. Like Gotta like sexy yes. exudates. Yes. I actually like that. That could be like a. Like That's the name of a band, sexy exudates. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You guys so, all have to wear like cardigan sweaters. Exactly. Yes. And like lo-fi vibe for sure. That's the thing. I'm glad you know me. So, like, I feel like you're I'm like. Are you I'm me? I'm just making assumptions, <laughs> but yes. Yeah. I guess I do. Yeah. So then I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to like research this. And then I just did like a small project on that. And then I got hooked up with this other professor who wanted me to do like my actual like year long research project for the master's degree on lignin degradation. So he wanted okay. to make a bioreactor where he was using enzymes from mushrooms to degrade lignin into valuable products. Like for instance, vanillin. So these like lignin Ooh, is just a complex, okay. large molecule and it can be broken down into component parts. Like, you know, if you didn't want to grow a bunch of vanilla orchids and like pollinate the the flower on the one night of the year that it blooms or whatever. Right. Like, then you then you just like make synthetic vanilla. And he was like trying to make a bioreactor to make these small principal components of lignin um, right. that could be valuable financially and stuff so i just did all the research for that so i did a non-thesis master's degree because it was thank you alan it's pizza night so i just got handed pizza um wait domino's delivers down there <laughs> no but like this one looks handmade like it's Ooh. It's handmade nice yeah. um but um yeah i so i was like okay you know like I'm going to do this project. So it was all theoretical. It was like, so it was, I was just like really in my head about it. And then I graduated and in the summer of 2015, my brother died from a, like a drug overdose. And oh, right I am that, so I sorry. Met, you guys know, thank you, Alan. I, you know, Tug, Tug, Tug. Um, he's mm -hmm. like a mushroom identification guy in like Southeastern Pennsylvania, which okay. is like where I lived in Philly. So I, I, went out in the field with him a couple of times. And then um, I went to Myco Fest, like right after my brother died. Cause I was like, I need some new friends. Like I'm just like, I was devastated obviously. Um, Cause my, my brother died of a fentanyl overdose. Mm. I was just like, it was terrible people hanging out, not hanging out with good people. Like I was like, I need to get, and I wasn't addicted to drugs or anything, but I was like, just 
just in like I need a completely new group of friends, right? So right. I um I went to Myco Fest with my homie William Padilla Brown. You guys probably know him. You know William? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. it says that says festival, right? Yeah. yeah. So I went to the first one, like in twenty fifteen, when there was only like forty of us. And I hung out with like William and like Olga from Smoketown Mushrooms and like Tug and like, you know, like all these really great like names of people in mushrooms. And you then, got to go hang out with the cool kids. And Alex Dorr. Yeah. But it was like all like before ever before anyone was like really doing you know, everyone's mm -hmm. just like kids literally. Right. So I then uh you know, fast forward to this year. So I've been to almost every MycoFest and I started talking at MycoFest in like, so I got inspired by Mike, the people at MycoFest because I was like, okay, a lot of these people are younger than me. Like I'm 37 now. So like, it was like, I was like around 30 and I was like, a lot of these people are younger than me and like, they're giving talks. Like why, why don't I give a talk? So I decided to make, in 2017, I made my talk chemistry for mycologists where I was like, okay, I know chemistry. So let me just like teach this to my colleges because that's what I know. So I'll offer my skill of teaching what I know. Um, awesome. So it was like really cool because a lot of people, I mean, you can cultivate mushrooms all day, but not understand what pH is. Like, Correct. Yes. Like, so it's really a cool skill. So basically <laughs> I was like, okay. So then the next class that I did the next year in 2018 spoke at Michael Fest again. And I did, um, molecular biology for mycologists and then i did a talk at new moon mycology summit that was called pharmacognosy so it was like or sorry myco i'm sorry mycopharmacognosy so i almost got my degree in pharmacognosy that professor that i was talking about mm -hmm. he was like a pharmacognosy professor but then i was like okay i'm gonna take this and then make it into like mycopharmacognosy and then over the pandemic, I built that class out to like a four hour class and I did it online and I think I had like 20 people on Zoom and it was like really amazing. It was so awesome. But I kind of realized that it's just hard for me to do classes online. So I, and then I had a lot of stuff going on. Like I was like living in North Carolina. I had to like move back to Maryland. I had like just a really lot of stress, like getting out of a relationship and stuff. And then like, you know, finding myself again. So like 2021 into 2022 was like me, like, really going inward and like going deep. And I was like, I really need, I need to like do hot yoga. I need to journal, I need to meditate. I need to like do, and, and, and a lot of times it's like, it's not working. So like for months I was like, it's, it's not working, but I'm keeping doing it. I'm still depressed. Like I had COVID. It was so shitty. It was like just a series of shitty events. And then last summer came um, August of 2022. And I was speaking at MycoFest as usual. And, um, I was doing my class, chem the chemistry of cordyceps, and um, that's when I met Alan. So I met Alan. I was on this, like, really high, like, I w I'm on my healed girl summer tip. Like, I literally am, like, I was talking about you. Uh, and I was, like, in a great place, and then I met Alan. And then, um, you know, he saw my talk at Michael Fest, and then, um, you know, we kind of, like, slowly, like, started collaborating then I saw him at Telluride and I was like I want to be your assistant and like help you so it kind of started out as like a research collaboration type of thing just like very work work based and right. now we are together as a couple as of January Michael love that's one of our favorite topics on the Michael geeky podcast Is yes <laughs> yes we love we, we Whenever it rears its head, we, we love to talk about it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we, really awesome. And, and we just decided that um, we, we should put our skills together and, um, you know, like create some cool stuff. So I have all this logistics and coordination skills. So I decided we need to, like, do this for it. And you did need to do it. You did. Yeah. I agree. Okay. We I think it's great. Down here. So that's I, the thing. We're already coming down here. So, I foresee within five years, you guys will never even be home. You're just going to go from one foray to the next, 
maybe I mean, two that's... years straight, then you get burned out, then you take a year off. Yeah, that's yes. what Alan was doing. So, like, last year he was, like, I think he was at, like, 50 mushroom events or something, and I don't think that was an exaggeration. Like, no, I don't think it was. It was, like, a different thing every weekend. So he traveled around a little bit last year, but it wasn't, like, it just was, you know, like, it was hard because I lived in Maryland. He lived in California. So then I came out to California to speak at Soma Camp to do my newest talk, which is called DNA Sequencing for Mycologists. So we always knew that we wanted to do the DNA barcoding, DNA sequencing, like, together. Like, right. we, we, as soon as we met, we were like, we have to do this together. You know, like, this is, like, I just have the, like, I just always wanted to do it. And, like, when I was in my... In the past, I, like, felt, like, maybe, like, crushing myself. Like, maybe I, I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't be doing it or, like, you know, Alan's doing it, but, like, I'm not doing it. And, like, I had never met him before, and I was intimidated because I had never done anything with mushrooms. But turns out it's really not that hard, and that's the reason why Alan's traveled around for years, literally, like, teaching people yeah. legitimately, like, how to do it. So now we're kind of joined forces in that too so like this year i'm gonna do my talk so i did it before so you know heart singer yeah he'll he, i'm gonna have him on in about a month i think cool yeah. so yeah i work with heart at fundus and then um just like friends with him and stuff um and then we go to entheom retreat together in mexico so um heart um, when I was at Soma Camp this January, I did uh, my DNA sequencing for mycologist talk, and then Hart already had like a um, practical lab scheduled. Right. So I just scheduled myself for my talk before his. So then he didn't have to explain PCR. He didn't have to explain anything. I already explained it all, and then they just jumped right into doing the, the barcoding. So that's nice. kind of where I yeah, that's kind of like where I saw myself fitting in because. A lot of times Alan or Hart or like these like really smart like people, they just don't really give the background. So like my talk is like, what is DNA? Like, first of all, what is a molecule? Like, second of all, what is DNA? Like, what is the story of DNA? So it's like kind yes. of like Yes, sometimes, you know, once you get to the, the hey, what's up, man? Just chilling, having some pizza in the Amazon casually. That, you know, I, I heard I heard you guys are uh, enjoying the Glamazon down there. It's so nice. The Glamazon, dude. I, nice. Honestly, I did it. It's like shabby chic, but not shabby, yeah. more chic. It's yeah. Great. It's Greg's birthday yesterday. Oh, happy birthday. Belated birthday. Thank yeah. You, Thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming to say hi. Yeah. yeah. I'll let you guys have a real conversation. Yeah. Maybe <laughs> no worries. What up, everybody? Come out See you, man. Come visit. Come find the mushrooms. <laughs> Cool. Uh, find some. <laughs> yeah, he's cool. Yeah, nice. so we just met Greg today. He's super cool, though. Yeah, so we, we made a Facebook group, and then everyone kind of talked to each other beforehand, everything. But That's good. I mean, even if you didn't make the Facebook group, you guys are wandering around in the jungle together. You're eat, you know, you're, it's that when you really rough it, I feel like people really bond together and I can tell you guys are really roughing it there. So, you know, the, the bonding is guaranteed. Yes. You know, I have had a lot of bites and we aren't sure what they are. So it's not all glitz and glam. Right. Like I've been itching every night. I'm like, it's either chiggers, fleas, like, I don't know what it is, but. They do have bugs down there, yes. Yeah, I'm pretty bit off of my ankles, yeah. so it's not like all like, oh, this is just great. But right. and we've gotten stuck out in the rain a couple times, like really hard rain, and you know, um, like Alan broke his phone since we've been here, so it hasn't been like all incredible. <laughs> but I also I rolled up. We met this other. We met this such a cool dude named Alex, who's been living in the Amazon for like four years. And okay. um, actually, his friend Zane is sponsored by Oxford Nanopore, so he gets like, all the DNA barcoding reagents for free. Nice, which is amazing. Um, yeah, so they're studying reptiles in the in the Amazon, and they're kind of like a diff It's a, it's really cool. They have their it's just like on the middle of nowhere. It's, it's like the way I'm obsessed with, and you're obsessed with mushrooms, just with reptiles. Kind of. Yes. Yeah, and they have there's like. Oh my God, there's these cordyceps caves. So there's like caves down here where you find cordyceps in caves. So they told us about that too. And I was like, what? Yeah, what? <laughs> what? What are they feeding on? 
I mean, they're eating the bugs in the caves. Oh, the like, bugs in the caves. Okay. So they're probably eating like the, those crazy like white blind bugs that are, like live in. They get them cornered. They like get them trapped in the cave, and then the cordyceps just line up. Like, where are you going? Nowhere. We got you. Sorry, I've been watching too much The Last of Us. I think. Yeah, I mean that's kind of how I convinced. <laughs> I had a photographer down here photographing us. And that's mm-hmm. kind of how I convinced her to come down, because I was like. This is like the real The Last of Us. Like the this, real version, yes. This is like really it. Because, you know, insects are, the, sorry, fungi are the number one, like, killer of insects. So, like, without fungi, insects would be, like, taking over the world. Uh, then I am, yes. <laughs> Let's just take a moment to thank Cordyceps then. <laughs> yeah. Actually, you know what's crazy, and I have this in my chemistry of cordyceps talk. There's six distinct phyla, so they're of fungal entomopathogens. They're actually spread out over six phyla, which is like almost like all the freaking phyla. So they're very, you know, there's many categories, not just cordycepaceae mm. or ophiocordycepaceae. Like I thought it was when I first started that presentation. I was like, whoa. There is so not like Massospora, the the, the one you just you mean the one you just took a cool photograph of? No, that oh. was on a grub. That was Ophiocordyceps. Oh. But there's like Massospora. Maybe one more piece. Can you come over and say hi in a minute? Okay. All right. Thanks. Um. Yeah. So like, I don't know if you know about like the. Massospora. I do not. Cordies are like a foreign language to me. I'm. I, I do not. I, I've been trying to. I can't even get uh, Will William to to respond to my DMs. So yeah, I've been trying to figure out who who's going to come on and talk about cordies with me. But yeah, the the plan will be to go a little bit deeper on on cordyceps here soon. So I actually with William. So so I told you me and William have been friends for a while. And um, with just a side note of William, so he started North America's first commercial cordyceps farm Yeah. in Asheville like several years back. Well, actually, the culture that he used was a clone from uh, cordyceps that I found in the woods. What? So, <laughs> yeah, it was called Cordyzilla. I like it. Yeah, so thank you. You basically, you basically were foreshadowing uh, the new HBO smash hit. Uh, the last of us i mean yeah. essentially it was um it had 10 stroma so it was like it was a 10 headed cordyceps wow militaris and then that was used to <laughs> william used that a clone of that to start north america's first commercial cordyceps nice. farm and you know after you like sector it and sector it so much it like loses the mating types or whatever off the dish so eventually like all of those that like that strain kind of got separated like too much by most people so it kind of like went out of vogue after like a year or two Mm. but yeah that cordyzilla was from something i found in the woods which is amazing and um i do i do still know one guy that grows it in the uk so he he's been able to keep it going all these years so that was probably 2016 i think was nice. yeah um so yeah i like really do like actually i'm like a very i'm very like really low-key like cordy hunter and then up in pennsylvania you know where i used to live and like where michael fest is and like that's where will lives um he, uh, there's like military spots oh and then jeff um Maganero also lives up there um there's so many cordyceps spots that are like you just go and it's like it's really like hemlock bogs um like low-lying hemlock bogs and you can find like hundreds in a day i mean it's not that hard to find like really great genetics Um, well i might have to get over there because i mean i'm i'm literally two hours from pittsburgh now i know philly's a little bit further but yeah I'm talking about like the middle of Pennsylvania. Oh, even like better. The middle of PA. Nice. I'm gonna take Alan there this summer. Oh, here he comes, Mr. America, Mr. Latin America. <laughs> <sighs> 
I know everybody wants to talk to Alan. He's like the real. Hey, how's it going? What's up, brother? I always finish dinner here. It was really good. They had a whole bunch of different kinds of pizza. I, I, I got a, a brief glimpse of a couple pieces that definitely look good. Yeah, a whole bunch of different kinds. They got a big old pizza oven here, so it's like lots of yummy homemade pizza. Nice. Um, so you guys have been down there for two weeks. Yes. I've, I've gotten just a tiny little glimpse from, from you and Mandy's pages, um, but, but how's it going so far? Are, are, are you happy? Do you got uh, regions you haven't hit yet? Like, what's the plan for this week? We are very happy, and almost the whole country is a region we haven't hit yet because <laughs> right. uh, we're staying with Furhat, and he's got, like, 50 hectares of oh, wow. property here. So maybe two or three days, we, like, uh, kind of went up the road and, uh, like, you know, went, like, an hour and a half drive or something. So a couple other places. Um, but for the most part, we've been hunting around here. And um, you're even finding a lot of really cool stuff. Uh, but, yeah, not even scratching the surface for the whole country. That's awesome. So, so should be at the waterfall. Yeah, so, this waterfall. And we found, uh, I found Salasabi Moseri there three years ago. So I went to check in the Moseri spot, and it wasn't there. But about 20 feet away, we found a different Salasabi, maybe Salasabi Stemetsii. Mm, okay, nice. When um so how many uh, so how many times have you been there first off? This is my second time in Ecuador. Okay, cool. And the first uh, the first trip you found how many psilocybin containing species? Uh, just the psilocybin just, most area. Just that one. So now you're you're at two. Do you is there like a goal? Are you like if I could we, find three we more? Found, we found psilocybin today. Um, yeah, so this, today they found psilocybin psilocybins. I got oh, a whole cool. box full of uh, psilocybin psilocybins. Um, from the other day. So we found that three times so far, and then we found this other one. There's some gymnopilus, but who knows if that, those are active. Nice. Cool. So what? Um, so how many people you got down there for this week? 13. There's 13 people. And you guys are just... So are you guys staying in a group? Are you guys, like, trying to spread out, and then you, re, you like, kind of regroup every few hours? Or how do you guys work it? Yeah, we try to stay together, but there's always people like setting up cameras and tripods, so it's pretty hard. It's like herding cats, but if people feel right. like staying together, they'll they'll stay together, and if not, then you know some people go ahead. Nice. Yeah, so we're gonna do talks and stuff too. So okay. there will be like a talk on Girl. probably mushroom photography tomorrow. Maybe you want to do the mushroom photography one. I think then... I want to talk most. Uh, about how to use iNaturalist to identify stuff. So I want to teach people not just how to use iNaturalist, but like if you find like something, how to use iNaturalist to figure out what that thing is. For example, right. if you find a snake, uh, like me, I don't know much about snakes, but what I can do is just like have iNaturalist show me all the snakes that have been found within 10 miles of here. Sort of oh, okay. And then you get like it's like a make a real quick field guide to all the snakes in the region. And then you can just look through them real quick and be like, oh yeah, it's that one. And so you can do that with any organism, you know, any mushroom, like any you know, plant, whatever. So I want to teach people how to do that, and also a little bit of photo post uh, photo post processing because a lot of people have brand new cameras, they don't really know how to use. Right. So yeah. People like what I do my pictures after I take the picture to, to make it into like a, a, a real work of art. Um, we have someone that wants to say hi. I, I saw somebody peering, yeah, peering hello, behind there. What's up, brother? I'm Jacob. What's up, Jacob? He's one of our youngest people here. He's All right. Really Jacob, where are you from? I am from Sacramento. Nice, yeah. man. And you just, you quit your job and it was either you're going to audition for American Idol or go down to Ecuador with Alan and Mandy and you pick the latter, huh? It's normally the case. Nice. <laughs> awesome. Well, I hope, I hope you have a blast down there. Take a lot of pictures, oh, yeah. pay attention, look under every nook and cranny and find something really cool, man. Exactly. There's we're something really cool, down. like every 10 feet. So I bet. Yeah, yeah. Constantly yeah. just like walking. I think in a little bit we're going to do uh, an ultraviolet night hike and then uh, we're going to have uh, some music playing. Nice. Um, I, I don't know if you've ever scuba dived, but one of my favorite uh, yeah. dive experiences was a night dive 
that wasn't for mana rays. It, it was just to see the photoluminescent <laughs> little creatures. Yo, you just, I just had... did that in Hawaii. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, that's where I did it. It's amazing, yeah. isn't it? It's so yeah. Cool. You go out, it's like oh, 1 a.m. and you're just like yeah. in the ocean. In just the bottom of the ocean, just chilling, just, just lost, like, man. You just blink and like two hours went by. It's crazy. It's nuts. Like some of them are like 15 feet, like yep. massive. They roll yep. right in front of you, and just, it was crazy. Yeah, and I did all that not on psilocybin, so <laughs> that tells you how amazing it is. Yeah, you don't even need it. It's 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 That's so funny. It, it's very much like the way Alan has done a real service for. Um, an interest in mycology by bringing that that the the nano spectrum uh, flashlight out and showing everybody that there's a whole nother way to look at all this stuff that's really cool. <laughs> yeah, and it was cool seeing all like the like different like animal like, like there's like, yeah, tons cool. of worms swimming that were just neon purple yep. like, types of crazy yeah. colors. It was it was super cool. Like, yeah. Different color, like, Sea cucumbers, all types of crazy stuff. Nice. Yeah. Oh, Selma's birthday. Oh, uh, see, guys, it's a vibe down there. I'm telling you, there's so much going on down in Ecuador. I, I'm just sitting in my basement by myself right now. I, I definitely am jealous. <laughs> Oh yeah! Oh, we met. Who's? It was the. That's amazing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hey, you gotta celebrate. I get it. Yeah, I that was. It. You can't not first, sing happy birthday. That was the first guy that interrupted us, Greg. Yep, that's awesome. <laughs> wow, not you guys. I I could not make it happen, but boy, are you guys making me wish I could have? Because you guys just look like you're having a blast down there. Yep, that's really cool. That's it is. awesome. That's really cool. All right, say more stuff, Alan. We'll be on here for the next couple minutes. Say more stuff. Yeah. So, what um, do you do? You have something that that you know is down there that that you are kind of hoping you'll you'll spot this week? Oh man, there is uh, some rare orchid that I was like the only person that had ever photographed it, okay. and I found more of that, and so I'm done looking for that. Uh, awesome. <laughs> There's a lot of very rare Check. plants here. Um, <laughs> yesterday, I put 150 different moths on iNaturalist, and a lot of those turned out wow. to be really rare. Um, I think tonight we're hoping to get some frogs and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, I don't know what any of this stuff is, so I just put it on an iNaturalist to let the experts uh, identify it. And, nice. you know, once somebody puts a name on it, then I look at the range. And if it's, like, something that barely anybody's found before, and that's really cool. And a lot of times, like, my picture is, like, way better than all the other pictures. So then right, yeah. I'm like, okay, cool. And so I'll, like, upload it to Wikipedia, make it make it the Wikipedia picture. That's awesome, man. Yeah, yeah it, it, on it, Wikipedia on some mushrooms is mostly, like, Alan's. Oh, oh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, I when uh, uh oh my when gosh, I look at this amazing ice cream that has brought us. Oh. Wait, you guys, like blackberry ice cream with a cookie and fruit. All right, I I officially don't believe you're at you're on a movie set. You're not in Ecuador. I don't believe you. Yeah, it's just really funny. Oh, and by the way, it's not the same time. It's. It was eight here when we started. Oh, so it is an hour different. Daylight savings time, and we don't. Uh, so we've been on the same time, and y'all suckers <laughs> and be be well, forward. <laughs> little did you know they were robbing yep. you of an hour. Mm-hmm. Yep. Thank you. Gracias. Well, anyway. your 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 host just seems amazing. I mean. I am, yeah, whether I get down there with you guys or I just go down there uh, another time, it it really seems uh, like... Yeah, well, there's, you know, this place is called Finca Hymatlos, so Furhat owns it, and he's the mushroom identification expert, but there's like mm -hmm. a dozen people working here, and they're all really cool. Awesome. And so, um, yeah, it's been it's a really, really nice place to hang out. Fantastic. So and what... Season's going to go on for another couple months, so... If people want to just like fly down here and go here, like you know, it's it's not just our place. People are welcome to come here and stay. It's right. Really cool. So, so what would you say the prime time uh, for mushrooms down there is? 
It's it like starts December. in uh, November, I think, yeah. the rains start, and then they continue through May. Yeah. Oh, so you could, yeah, you, there's a big chunk of time. It's yeah, not like right. a narrow window. Okay, that's cool. So that's pretty much like the whole winter in, uh, you know, uh, like the Northeast. Yeah, so perfect. Might, like as soon as it starts to get cold, you might as well just board, board a one-way flight to Ecuador. And then <laughs> as soon as you start seeing like mushrooms pop up in your Facebook feed from your friends around town, right. just uh, take a flight back. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Well, I know that's how you operate. You, yeah, you, yep. wherever, wherever the juiciest, prettiest, most unusual mushroom is, that is likely where you will be within if days. If you're willing to travel, it's mushroom season year round. Exactly. You, um, there, I forget what it was called, but there was a Jack Black movie about, uh, people that are really into birding. You know, they go around the world trying to identify as many birds as they can. And uh, I love that movie, but it, when I got to know you on social media, I was like, he's doing for mushrooms what these birders were doing for, you know, a, a love for, for, for birds. It's yeah, there's cool. a couple differences with birding. You know, the birders get up super early. So, yes. you know, like, you know, they're, they're, they're up at the crack of dawn and I'm up at the crack of noon. Right. The crack of noon. Yeah. Yes. Um, and also, you know, there's really no birds to discover. Like, all the birds have been documented. Um, whereas, like, you know, a lot of these mushrooms have not been documented. Which is crazy, because birds can fly. You'd think they'd be more elusive, but no. They also procreate and travel in huge flocks. And yes, they're very easy to identify. Not like sneaky, ground-dwelling fungi. Much harder. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. you know how many fungi you can even see? So he has yeah. uh, we have a microscope here. And then our a couple friend, of them. Three of them. Um, actually, our friend who's a, a music producer, he produces like drum and bass music. Mm -hmm. He came. Um, he's actually a new friend, but I've been listening to his music for like 15 years. Funny enough. Um, cool. I know exactly who he was. Anyway, he brought his microscope too. So we have a, a, like three microscopes here too, which is great. So a lot of identification can happen here. That's um, awesome. Yeah, there's this really cool like gazebo, um, kind of like in the middle of everything. And um, we set up the scopes like in, right in there. You'll have to see it sometime. It's uh, really badass. The, my, my intent is definitely to see it, um, ho hopefully sooner than later. Um, so what... Um, so, I mean, you don't got the Olympus. I, I think I asked you this no, uh, last week. So I'm using um, microscopes that live in South America this week. Okay. That are, that are indigenous to, to, to Ecuador, the Ecuadorian yeah, microscope. Ecuador. One of them yeah. right now came in from Colombia. Nice. Very cool. So, um, so will you be doing then? So, I mean, let's just talk a little bit about the, the forays and what people can expect and uh, uh, kind of what happens. You've said a little bit about the, the photography aspect of it, um, a little bit about the iNaturalist, um, I, and you just said you got three microscopes ready to rock down there. So I'm assuming you'll be doing some microscopy, mounting, you know, slides and, and uh, you know, how to identify cystidia, stuff like that. So you're really kind of giving these, these uh, guests of yours really the the full experience they're getting the field mycology they're getting the eye naturalist they're 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 connecting all the dots in, in in one week it's pretty cool right and i think zane is going to bring a nanopore sequencer so we can do Ooh. DNA barcoding and all the stuff as well nice well you're going to need that nanopore because it sounds like you you're you're going to be collecting a lot of mushrooms here in the next few days yeah we see a lot of stuff we just went out you know real quick a couple hours and yeah, you know, it was like herding cats. Everyone was stopping to look at something different, and they saw a lot of things that they'd only seen online and never seen in person. So, oh, that's amazing! It's always really exciting. Very cool. Yeah. Now, now, did you guys bring your bug spray? We did, but there's really not that many bugs here. Okay. Like, um, there's like a few mosquitoes around us. Kind of like if you don't wear bug spray, you might get like one or two mosquito bites per uh, hour. So they're they're not at all thick, but around yeah I, I don't get bit but i do i'm getting bit by a mysterious thing and i don't know what it is but whatever it just likes you more i'm the same i grew up in michigan and uh in the summer we had a lot of mosquitoes 
and some people definitely got bit more than others. I don't know if it's blood type or, or what. There's a lot of theories, but they definitely prefer some people over over others. Well, I also wear a lot more bug spray. Oh, see, so you do wear bug. Okay. Oh yeah, he I love bug spray. He yes. himself in beat, and I'm like kind of disgusted by it. So yeah, I mean, I it, don't. But it works. It does. It's, yeah, I mean, it obviously works. It like, works. But whatever. Mandy, we're all going to die of something someday. I know. Whether it's deep or, no. I mean, a it's solar like flare could take us all out tomorrow. You got to just go for it. Just, just use some deep. Like, I'll like touch it my skin and bitter, get it in yeah. my mouth. And oh, yeah. Don't get it in your mouth, though. No, but like I'll touch some, I'll like scratch something that's already there and then it'll get in my nail and then it'll get in my eye and get in my mouth. It's so gross. Like, it's yeah, we, we've discussed that about uh, the isopropyl alcohol as well, the denatured alcohol. Yeah. All and the... I wonder how much that isopropyl alcohol really, really helps. Like one time I washed my hands really good in isopropanol for like uh -huh. 30 seconds, you know, rubbing it in and then I did a thumbprint on a Petri dish and man, so much stuff yeah. through. Yeah. I really wish I had done another one with like just washing my hands with soap and water. Oh, I can guarantee you that's that's the 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 soap. This is what. Do you remember when antimicrobial soap was a thing? And I thought, well, this is weird because soap in general is antimicrobial. Like, what additional? It washes does, it away. It got, does it have more lye in it or what? Like, um, yeah, for sure. I work in healthcare, and I promise you, um, the preference is that that we're intermittently actually washing our hands with soap. Yeah, you never that. see a doctor like spraying anything down with isopropanol. No. Um, Ever. I just want to like really quick interrupt you guys to just um, give my friend Brian a shout out who's watching this right now. Brian from Mycopolitan in Philly. Hi, Brian. I miss you. Um, Mandy, you paused like you thought he was going to talk back to you there for a minute. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. <laughs> shout out to Brian. <laughs> He's so cool. He owns Philly, Philly's Mushroom Farm. Nice. Um, Michael, Michael Politan. Yeah, he's so cool. Like he's a mushroom grower. I guess that's why he listens to your podcast. <laughs> yeah, he's amazing. We, yeah, we're, you know, we're, we're talking about growing mushrooms. If you grow mushrooms, there's, there's, yeah, there's, yeah there might be an interest for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, cool. Well, what else did you want to... I don't know what else did you want to know. I forgot. We said so, it. I mean, you, you covered your kind of how you got into mycology. Um, I might be a little interested in knowing uh, other areas of interest. Like, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on right now about uh, molecular, not just uh, in the fungal barcoding realm, but, you know, uh, we're going to later be talking about wood lover's paralysis. Um, you know, there's a lot of private interest trying to figure out how they can get fungi to make all sorts of novel compounds for, you know, a million different reasons. Is there anything that sort of piqued your interest recently or um, stuff that you kind of keep track of uh, the development of? Hmm. Well, I mean, wood lover's paralysis is interesting because anybody who claims that they know what's causing it is just, you know, talking nonsense. So they yeah. can speculate until the cows come home, but not really going to do a bit of good. I agree. The um, I, I mean, so here's my thing about about it. it having uh, worked in the ER for a while, you know, some people come in and they say, well, here are my symptoms. They might even say, here's what I think's going on. And then, you know, we have a battery of protocols and tests and uh, imaging that we can do and find it. And then other people come in and go... Um, you know, I think I have this, or uh, here's my sequela symptoms, I don't really know what's going on, and there's stuff that modern medicine just doesn't know about yet. And Yeah, you know, you know like, uh, any mushroom will have more than a thousand chemicals in it. Right. And that's a lot of different chemicals, and we don't know what all those chemicals do, and, yep. you know, it'll be thousands of years before we really do, so there's a, a lot of mysterious stuff, and there's... You know, and then your body has, you know, many, many thousands of chemicals that interact with those thousands of chemicals yeah. and spectrums. So it's honestly way more complicated than we really have the ability to comprehend. Though I think we will discover the cause of wood lover's paralysis in my lifetime. But, you know, I'm not, like, going to hold my breath. Don't. And don't, you know, you wouldn't want to, like, create your own paralysis waiting to learn about wood lover's paralysis either. 
Yes. Yeah, I mean, I do believe it's a real thing. Clearly, it happens to a lot of people, but I'm not sure if it's caused by psilocybin or some other molecule. Right. Yeah. Yeah, well, we're going to talk about it. I, I don't think we... It doesn't have cubes, does it? It doesn't. No, it, I mean, it really does seem to be... Uh, and it seems to be uh, mostly people in New Zealand. Um, all well, the like stories I Ruganoso over there. So. Yeah, I hear a lot of stories are, are New Zealanders. So who the knows? The United States also has quite a, quite a bit of wood lovers paralysis. Oh yeah, okay. I, I haven't heard about. And then the, you have the Salasbio Vodio Sistidiata is not anywhere closely related to the other wood lovers. It's you know over by Cubensis genetically. So I bet right. that did not cause it. I'm hoping to find some. I, I'm in Northeast Ohio, and I, I'm hoping to go I hang out with. A lot. It's yeah. in Ohio is especially common near the Ohio River. Yep. Is it the Cincinnati River? Yep. I the, gotta go the, down south along the south southern border of Ohio. Like every tributary is anywhere near that river is full of ovoids. Perfect. Uh, I can't wait. What you do is just uh, go on iNaturalist and Mushroom Observer, search for Salasbio vodiosa stidiata in Ohio. Yep. And it's like a heat map, you know, you see a lot of pins in some spots and not too many pins in those spots. So just travel to the nearest spot that has a whole lot of pins and they'll be right. all over the place if you're the right time of year. See, I never thought about that. The first person to mention that to me was uh, Ed Grant. He said that they found, I forget what kind of mushroom it was in, in uh, some jungle in Thailand. And he said that later a researcher used their iNaturalist post to locate the exact log. And I thought, wow, this is really powerful. You, you know, if, if you're logging the right data and the right photos and the right GPS information, it, it can be a really powerful tour, tool for future researchers. It really is. And whenever I put stuff on iNaturalist, I always try to make the coordinates as accurate as possible. So right. if somebody else comes along later and they're like, oh, that thing's awesome. I want to see it or I want to study it. They should be able to find the exact log. Right. Uh, I figure if I'm going to put in the time to actually find this thing in the wild, I want other people to be able to and find it. And then you can go back, too, yeah, yeah, if your GPS coordinates are good. Now, so do you use a special device, like a not your phone? Do you use some, something more specific, like some geo Sometimes I use the phone, and then my camera also has GPS in it. Oh, cool. So, okay. um, you know, either way, I make it sure. It gets I you pretty close. Pretty well. nice. There was a really good question up here by Mike. That said, ask Alan how he navigates being respectful to indigenous people and culture while foraging for mushrooms. So we went, I just want to answer that really quick. Yeah. And Alan, Alan can say something too. Um, we went over to this really cool indigenous tribe around here, um, the Sasha Wasi. I saw this post. This is what made me very jealous of you guys. I was like, that looks amazing. And yeah. And it's basically, so there's this guy, Scott. And he um, he has lived there for two years. He's like from Kansas City, and he has brought them power and internet and all sorts of stuff. Um, and right. he does traditional plant medicine ceremonies there, um, like ayahuasca, San Pedro, and then mushrooms. And so they normally I don't know where they get their mushrooms from, but. When we were there uh, on their property, they did like a tour. They gave us, they just like walked us through the woods and we found, that was one of the places that we found philosophy star lessons. And they were so interested to know. They were like incredible, like right before we got back on the boat to leave, um, Alan talked to them and told them how to identify the mushrooms. And I thought that was like, really cool because they do have, you know, a sacramental mushroom growing on their own property so they don't really have to get it from anywhere so he yeah actually, so this was a plant medicine tribe and they you know they have psilocybe growing right in their their ground but they didn't know and so i think so I mean, they did they did not ingest this mushroom no they didn't know about they didn't know what it was and so uh, now then now they know that they you know in their land you know just a quarter mile from where they're living is where we found this big beautiful cluster of psilocybe serolescence and when you know after we showed them they're like oh yeah we see those around sometimes like kind of growing in muddy areas and stuff and so yeah now they know but i think you know the being respectful of indigenous people uh, here in ecuador is very similar to being respectful of indigenous people in any country in the world um, you know you don't go in there and fuck their shit up you know don't yeah. litter but the most important thing is to teach them 
So there's a lot of things that uh, indigenous people can learn from us. Uh, for example, which mushrooms grow there, and also just general respect for the land. Um, a lot of times I go to Mexico and there's a lot of indigenous people around. And a lot of these indigenous areas are very poor. So the only way that these people can make money is like chopping down their trees and selling them to lumber companies, right. and things like that. And they're just going to do that if they don't see the value in their land. So they're showing up to these indigenous areas and sparking an interest in biodiversity, teaching them how cool their mushrooms are. You know, then they're going to realize like they have this valuable treasure that's disappearing quickly. And if they just like chop down their forest and sell it, you know, to a lumber company, then it's going to be gone and they won't even realize what they're missing if they don't, you know, real, if, if nobody tells them how cool their biodiversity right. is. So there's yeah, like, I mean, all those capitalists are banking on them not knowing any of those things. Sadly. Well, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, a lot of, they, they don't really have internet, so right. Right. they don't, like the, the inter, like in the United States, the interest in mushrooms and biodiversity <laughs> spreads over the internet. Right. Uh, but they're, they're not really online so much. So it's kind of like you got to go there and spark their interest in person. Exactly. Yeah. That, that was a good question. That was um, a good question. I, um, I don't. Yeah. So I wanted to bring up something else too, which I didn't talk about. We just completely skipped over my other two jobs. Um, so I also, me, actually, Alan also is kind of, works for this company but um it's it's a nonprofit. it's called fundus so okay. fungal diversity survey and you can you can go to fundus.org um fung the fungal diversity survey is for it's north america's only fungal biodiversity conservation organization so we're not in north america right now but um i'm the the lead communicator so i do all the social media posts and all the newsletters and stuff like that for fundus Nice. Um, and um, it's a really, really great organization. Honestly, I feel like a really great guest would be my boss, the director, Gabriella. Cool. Um, great. Really cool. She's like a lot younger than me, too. Yeah. And like she's just really scrappy and great. And she knows a lot. And she's great at speaking. Um, so then, then Alan is a mushroom collector for Fundus. So Fundus is doing a project that's the first of its kind ever in North America where the state of California um, gave grant money to Fundus to deploy foragers into the field. They're, they're called collectors. They, they deploy California Fundus collectors into the field in California to uh, collect mushrooms for pay. So there's people getting paid to collect mushrooms, make high quality observations of mushrooms right now in California as the first state statewide project of its kind and they hope to make california kind of like a model state for that um so that every state can you know have these kind of programs to right. have foragers you know it mo mostly we well, who they contacted were already like people that were foraging um but you know they're they're collectors and then um uh christian schwartz is the the collections lead so he's like amazing you know wrote all those books and stuff and um yeah so ca the california fundus is like going strong they also have the these biodiversity projects in the northeast um um called like the northeast rare fun fungi challenge where they try to get people to go around in the northeast in the west and and um you know find these mushrooms that are rare so there's that, so there's Fundus. And so then, why don't you just take a quick minute and tell everybody why that matters? Why is that important? Why should we want to know where mushrooms are? Yeah, it's the same thing that Alan just said about, like, the tribes. Like, if you don't know what's there, then there's you don't know how to protect it. So right. um, you, to even know what's there is super important. So, right. you know... All these mushrooms are being collected um, right now only in California, but uh, the amount of like, it's really an unprecedented um, campaign that they're doing there. And um, I really hope that we can get it going in more areas of the United States. And this is just starting. And, we, you know, they really need, it's a nonprofit, like they really rely on donations and stuff like that. Um, even just like 
signing up for a year of the newsletter is like really a huge help. Um, so that's so that's Fundus. That's nice. North America's only fungal diversity, or sorry, North America's only fungal conservation organization that exists. And then I also work for NAMA separately, um, separate organization, which is the North American Mycological Association, which is a pretty prestigious organization. It's um, focused on educating um, people about mushrooms. And Mm -hmm. we are the umbrella organization of almost 100 um, mushroom clubs in North America. So um, what I do there is I'm the foray chair. So I host the foray, the main right. the main event stuff. foray. Yeah. Um, yes. And this is my first year. And this year we're going to be having our foray in Southern Appalachia. So every year it's in a different place in a different region in North America. So um, the, the annual foray this year is in, we're calling it Appalachia Nama 2023. And um, it's in Southern Appalachia, and it's going to be so fun and so great. And it's a bunch of, like, the top-tier mycologists that you've ever heard of, plus a bunch of, like, amateurs. Nice. And it's, like, you know, it's, it's amazing. We have Arlene Bissett as our – this is actually – I haven't announced this yet, but Arlene Bissett, the infamous – All right, guys, don't tell anybody. The secret stuff. <laughs> it's going to be coming out this week. It's going to be premiering in the Mycophile. But nice. um, yeah, Arlene Bissett is going to be our host mycologist. So she's awesome. going to be identifying all the mushrooms there. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, her, her husband will be there. And um, everyone, so many, so many really cool mycologists are going to be there um, that I, I can't like say yet because she's the only one that's like confirmed right now but um ticket more information will be coming out soon and tickets will go on sale it i have freaking fingers crossed april 1st but they're redoing their whole website right now so it's like kind of like a whole thing a whole dramatic thing but um it's got it right yeah hopefully april 1st and you can follow (laughs) me on instagram at mushroom madman to find out about that because <clears throat> Where in Southern Appalachia? It's Hendersonville, North Carolina, baby. Nice. And Hendersonville, sugar pie. Yeah. I, I fully expect if I go down there, <laughs> I only want you to talk to me in the accent. One hundred percent. Of course, I will, sugar. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. It's. I lived outside of, <clears throat> like about an hour and forty-five minutes west of Asheville, so it was like an hour nice. and forty-five minutes from this place. Because Hendersonville is just south of Asheville. Um, well, I mountain bike, so I got two reasons to go down there. So, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm going to yeah. be there. I'm, I'm pretty much guarantee it. Oh, my God. that's That would be awesome because if you want to come, we could definitely do a live podcast from the event. Oh, that'll be a blast. Yes, let's do With, that. With, like, Arlene Bissett or, like, yes. a couple of my other keynotes or whatever. Yeah. Sounds I'm good. I'm totally down to do that. We could definitely do that. Alan will be there. We can get the, the internet to, like, pop in and... Yeah, we can definitely do that um, because nice. I'm in charge and I can just say that we can do that. So. That's, hey, <laughs> it, it, it's, it, it's sounding like it's all going to work out. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's okay. So <clears throat> thanks for keeping me on track. Lobster bush bro. Bro. Yeah, <laughs> bro. the extra O. Oh, it's the extra O. Oh, yes. Oh. Um, yeah, so... Um, thank you, Lobster, Mr. Lobster. Um, it is August 24th through 27th, 2023. Nice. Um, and we, yeah, we're, it, the place is so nice. It's a Canuga Conference Center. And it is like, it's like a, it's like a religious camp or something, but it is so nice. Um, tickets start for the weekend. If you do like a double room and, have no air conditioning, which is fine because you're in the mountains. It's like two, or sorry, two. It's like five, 50 or 575. We're still working out the budget. And then the, the highest room, if you want AC and you want to come as a single person, you don't want to stay in a room with anybody else or have us match you up, then it's going to be like 650. But 
that's a whole weekend. That's nice. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and no, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night. But it's so it's three nights and four days because uh, on Sunday we do the table talk and everything. So it's like it's still going on Sunday. And I'm going to have really cool musicians on Friday and Saturday night. Um, it's just going to be really, it's going to be. It's going to, it's going to be almost as, as amazing as the vibe you got going down there in Ecuador right now. Yeah. It, it's probably going to be even better because we're going to be vouchering and like, you know, Stephen Russell is going to be there. Mm-hmm. Like the God of DNA barcoding, like all awesome. DNA barcoding. And um, I, I heard he's going to sequence one million samples while he's down there. He wants to do. He his goal is to sequence a hundred thousand in the next yeah. ten years. I, yes, so, I so know. We'll, he's always talking about. I mean, I don't see why not. He's running a thousand at a time, and the right. last post I saw said he's getting about eighty percent. You know, solid sequences out of that that right. Which minion. Is terrible, so. by the way, but yeah. But um, hey, eighty percent of of a thousand is still eight hundred sequences yeah. in one go, man. That's still pretty great. Better than Sanger sequencing. Um, yep, yeah, on many yes, I guess I did say six hundred and fifty dollars for a full mm-hmm. weekend, all meals included, mm-hmm. ticket. Yes. Food and lodging, people. It's everything. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I did. Yes, you can camp. There will be a limited number of camping tickets available for some first come first serve. And when the tickets go on sale, I bet you they're all gonna sell They'll out be in gone. Like a day. Like. Yeah. Because apparently in 2015, the last time they had it in Nashville, they sold out in four days. I, so, and this is going to be like even better, like way better. So I'm super excited. Well, and I have so many cool people come. Like I just, the lineup is just insane. So yeah, so I can't so, wait. To so as it. soon as the website's straight, that's all going to be announced or you're going to, tickets it, will go on sale and then it'll be like a music festival where slowly there's more announcements of yeah conf- no it'll be it's not gonna be like that it's gonna be like so it's really called registration so registration mm-hmm. we're trying to get it to open on april 1st which will be on the new website so we're migrating everything into the new website now so either it's gonna be april 1st or i'm gonna put out an announcement and it's gonna end up being like april 15th or something but you can literally I, I, you, all I can tell you, like, is April 1st right now, you can, it, you will need to be a NAMA member. So you have to sign up for NAMA. Step one, guys. The NAMA Step member one. To even get, and it's $25 a year, and you get all, a bunch of really cool stuff, not just access to the 4A tickets. There's, like, talks, and, like, there's other regional 4As. We're, we got a regional 4A going on, on down in Mexico. Not with me and Alan. It's, um, it's Zach. He was super cool doing a Mexico, Mexico foray. Um, and I, yeah, I'm like really, oh my God, come here. Oh my God, look, 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 come here, come here, come here. Come here. Look, this is Galarina. Wait, they have dogs in Ecuador? Yes. What? I have to show you Galarina. <laughs> Ecuadorian canine. Look at that, guys. Okay, yeah. Um, you better you better make sure Alan does an iNaturalist uh, entry for that. <laughs> I was like, if this Galarina walks by, nice. he literally named her Galarina. Wow. Um, yeah, so she did, but I had to get her. But yeah, um, yeah, it's North American Mycological Association. It's namyco.org for those tickets. And yeah, it's and you can follow me. You can follow me, Mushroom Madman, on Instagram. And I'm, I make announcements just like all from my page because NAMA has this really cool thing going on where they have account takeovers. So I can't really like just go on and post because other people take over the account. Right. It's cool. And I'm not in charge of that. So that's fine. Um, but I do post yet. About it You're not in charge of it yet, Mandy. <laughs> I don't really you need to know. be. <laughs> I don't really need to be. 4 a chair is enough right. for me with NAMA right yes. now. But, um, cool. But yeah. Well, so <laughs> if I don't, if I don't have those, uh, links in the description, I will put them there guys. So don't worry. We'll we'll get all that. And then as the ticket information and all that stuff come in, I, I will do my best to keep that updated in the description, but pretty much it sounds like you, you just go, you become a member. Once you're a member, you're probably going to get yeah. the email. Yes. Yes. Once yeah. you're a member, you will get an email that says when registration is open. Yep. Perfect. So it's per, it's super easy and 
you know, it's it's a great organization. It really is. There's a lot of older, old heads, I'll call them, you know, like the, the OGs. OGs. All the OGs are in NAMA. Yes. Like, everybody is anybody are in NAMA, you know. And uh, I, I had somebody, uh, so somebody who's about to be on the show uh, in a minute here, uh, a newbie, asked the question uh, to me, um, can noobs go to these forays? Anybody can of go, course. right? You don't have to have yeah. a PhD in mycology to go on a foray. You just got to be alive and able to walk and, right, pay attention. Yeah, no, anyone can go. I met a bunch of cool people last year that were new to mycology, and I love it when new people come because yeah. it's just, everyone's so excited, you know, like super pumped, and then they get us even more pumped. And, and you're going to learn so much. I mean, if you're a newbie, you're going to learn the most. You're going to get the right. most value out of that trip. It's true. It's going to be like a mind, just right. everything is going to blow your mind. Yeah, it really, it really is. And we have, a, like, a lot of really cute things that we haven't even said yet this year. Like, just really cute, like, extra things that are happening. And, nice. um, yeah, we have about 14 forays going out to all different spots um, south of Asheville and in northern northern South Carolina, too. And um, Oh, so when you yeah. go down, you'll get to pick different events, like different yeah. trips. Oh, yeah. that's cool. There's 14 forays. Yeah, so there's 14 different. So there's so there's two all-day forays. So Friday and Saturday, you could do an all-day foray, or you could do, you know, there's like 12 other half-day forays on Friday and Saturday. And then uh, John Somer from Denver Club is leading the beginner's walk on Thursday. So, yeah, there's a lot of really cool stuff going on. Yeah, it's amazing. It's just such a great area. And... I used to live down there in North Carolina, like that Southern Appalachia is like one of the most biodiverse regions like on the planet, really. Like, Oh like, yeah, it's, that whole mountain range, the Ozarks all down through, or not the Ozarks, all the whole okay. Appalachian mountain range is just, yeah, yeah it's yeah. special. It's amazing, yeah. So I just yeah. wanted, I just want to make sure that I got in the Fundus stuff and the Nama stuff and that's, that's pretty much it. So, awesome. Yeah. Well, I, I I know it's getting late, and you guys have been yeah. roaming around the jungle, and I'm sure Alan is literally ready to walk down the trail again and go hunt for his frog. <laughs> so I, I, I won't keep you, but thank you so much for coming. Um, okay. Thank you. Especially uh, down there having the time of your life, taking the time out to talk to us about what you're doing down there. Uh, I really appreciate it. Of course. And thank you guys in the comments also for like being super funny. I wish that I would have signed in so I could have chatted back. Oh, that's the peanut gallery. You can you can always <laughs> count on some good stuff there. Yes. Yeah, that's been pretty funny. I was like looking at whatever the comments were when um, Alan was talking and it's like, yeah, it's like I think I believe they do have dogs down there. That was funny. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you. Thank All right, Mandy. Yeah, well, sure. we'll we'll have yeah. you back on again. You know, anytime you got something something big going on, uh, even if it's to stop in for five or ten minutes and just you know cool. give people a heads up, that's you're always welcome. Thank you. You're cool. such a sweetie, geeky. We're 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 just trying to take care <laughs> of the community over here. That's all. Well, I really appreciate you. Um, cool. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. And if you guys want to hit me up on whatever like on instagram or whatever just like hit me up so thank you all right take care bye. bye all right guys let me pull off i always say that don't i i'll pull off the overlay sorry all right all the way from ecuador mandy quark little, little uh alan action uh the ever elusive alan rockefeller uh we 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 pinned him down tonight we we heard from him that was great um before we move on to our next segment, I'm going to take just a minute. I uh, On Facebook this week, uh, I, I saw a post. Someone said, hey, I just bought this book on uh, Cubensis. And I thought, somebody wrote a book on Cubensis. What? This is cool. Anyway, I uh, tracked down the author and I said, hey, man, I want to, you know, I haven't even read your book, but I commend you for writing a book uh, and, and just going for it and uh, getting it getting it up on Amazon. So I, I'm going to bring in Taylor Yates, and he's going to tell you all about his new book. So, Hello. all right, welcome Taylor. 
Geeky, how are you? Thanks for letting me on, man. I appreciate it. Oh, appreciate man. You me on. My pleasure. You know what? I, I like people who give back to the community. So, I you know. I try. These com communities giving me a lot. So, if anything I could give back to it, I'd, I'd be happy awesome. to do so. All right, man. So, where is it? Let's see this book. Did you, you know, get them I in? Do, I, got, I got a copyright. It's, I, I kind of hate to call it a book. It's more. I, when I tell people it's a published list. This is you know what it looks book. like to me? It looks like a book, dude. It's a book. Just you call know, it a book. It, it's physical, but it's more of a. Do you mind if I tell a little backstory on it? Yeah, I'd love to tell my story. Okay. About um about three years ago, I kind of started this for my own purposes. Mm -hmm. I just started compiling a book on Google or like you know a list on Google Documents just on on history and origin for myself because yep. the lists out there there's there are multiple but they're older you know someone right. you know twenty years ago took the time to to find out what they found out on, on some sort of blog thread. Of, right. And, the, the, you know, it, it's just outdated. To put it in simpler words, it's outdated. Agreed. So I'll just put it in a, just, let me see, just a little, you know, just a, a quick little pictures, origin history I could find, everything I could find. I, I, I tried That's to awesome. scour. I well, tried to scour every single blog post I could find for the information. It took me a lot of time, so I was happy to share it. Let me tell you this, since we're about to talk to a bunch of newbies, I promise you there are a lot of newbies out there that they hear names, they see uh, they see the lists, right, that just mm -hmm. say, Chode Wave came from Uncle Jay, and this came from Dave Wombat, and this mm -hmm. is an old thing from Pasty White, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but they frequently don't have photos. People are always asking, well, what do they yep. look like? That so I, I know lots of noobs that would love to have a book like that. Yeah, that was a big thing. I made a, a list. It, it's actually still circulated out there. I shared it with my group Spore Swaps about two years ago. That list that I made when, you know, for myself initially, mm -hmm. I made it shareable with the community because I knew a lot of people could find it useful. If, if I could find it useful, I knew there were, you know, thousands of other people. So it circulated, and that was the number one comment I got back was pictures. Can you ever do pictures? And I yep. thought Ugh, it would take a lot of time, a lot of reaching out to people right. to verify pictures. And I just decided to take the plunge, and I did it. <laughs> That's awesome. It well, the great thing is you self-published, so I did. I did. you you're able now to every year you could do a, a second edition, a third uh, edition. Okay. So oh. you know this. I I personally really see this as a, a commendable act. You created this thing, and now uh, and we've already talked about this. You know, people have an opportunity to send you uh, new new crosses, new isolations, oh, yeah. new yeah. new new uh, cultigens, mm -hmm. and this can be an ever evolving book. Um, That's what I, I would like it to. I would. Love I, it to I, I think it's wonderful. All right, so hold that book up uh, to the okay. camera again, so everybody can take time. a good look. Cubensis History and Taxonomy by Same. Taylor Yates. Um, it is on Amazon. So all you got to do type in okay. Cubensis History and Taxonomy. You will find it. I will put the link in the description as well. Um, thank you. And, I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, guys, check it out. I, I, I think it's a great resource for people. I mean, me, after a year and a half, I would say a good amount of the cultigens, I know what they look like. I can identify uh -huh. them. But, man, for, for a newbie, uh, that just seems like a great resource. It's a, it's, so, a, it's, it's a lot out there. It's like, yeah. you know, there's a lot out there. Some people have libraries of 300-plus varieties. Yes. New well, dude, these, these days... These it's, days, you have to do a new edition every week. I got, I know, I understand. <laughs> yes. But I want, I would like to keep it as valid as I can. Yeah. You know, I don't yeah. want something just thrown around. A few people have reached out to me. Hey, can you throw mine in the book? And I'm like, ah, man, you gotta get. Let, let me hear about it myself first yeah. before, you know. I would like, I would like to keep it as valid as I can because it is a good resource. I'd like to keep it That's honest. Awesome. And I, I tried my best. I tried. My, I appreciate you bringing me on, Geeky, very oh, much. Man. Man. Anytime, I'd love to come back if you uh, want to, you know. Yeah, oh, I think we'll, her. yeah, we'll have to do that. Okay. Uh, if you well, need a filler episode, I'd, be, I'd love, to, love to be on. <laughs> perfect. Well, I, you know, I wouldn't mind doing a, a, an episode where we talk about uh, people who figure out a, a, a way to give back to the community. So uh, I, I, that, that sounds cool. like a great one to have you on for. There's a lot All of right. good people in the community that need to be shouted out, and you've done a good job at that, Geeky, so I, I can you for your podcast. I agree, bro. man. You've all right dude good, good words thank you Geek. well, well thank you, you so that. much hey guys if you want to check out his book it's on yeah, amazon uh yep cubensis history and taxonomy it's shiny it looks very cool um, uh, it's a gloss cover <laughs> yeah glossy i like it all right dude uh thank talk you. to you later i'll be hanging out man have a good podcast rest of your show all right yep see you brother all right guys so i i just saw that uh this week and i said i like this guy i, I don't even know this guy but this guy wrote a book 
good for you. Do you know how many people do that? Not a lot. Most people talk about doing things. This guy did something. So, anyway, I, uh, I want to have him on and let you guys know what he did. All right, so next up, we got the newbies. Yes, that's right. I've had a bunch of people message me saying, man, I love watching your podcast. I wish I knew what you were saying half the time. I don't know what you're saying. Um, could you possibly do some content that I can relate to? Um, and so, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. It's, I'm one guy. It's going to take me a while. Uh, but I thought the least I could do, maybe have on some new growers and uh, try to connect with them and, and see what it's been like for them, why they got into it and all that good stuff. So I'm going to pull them on. We got a few people. I had a few not show up, but that's okay. That's why I booked a bunch of them. All right. So let me pull everybody up here. All right, so first up, uh, she's from my Discord. Well, that's at least where I first met her. Um, she's uh, pretty active in my Discord and a few others. She's uh, a pretty new grower, but you know what? She asks good questions, and she takes the advice and runs with it, and she's doing fantastic. Uh, let me welcome to the podcast, Emily. What's up, Emily? What's going on? Hey there. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just keep pulling everybody in here, and then we'll get, we'll get to it. All right, next up, uh, also from my Discord, a um, uh, very new grower. I, I think he's just been, I think he's the newest of, of the three I got here, um, but he's doing great, and he's super helpful on my, he's like one of my right-hand men on, on my Discord. He writes bots for me and does all sorts of amazing stuff. I love this guy. Let me welcome to the stream, uh, Rufus Redcap. What's up? How much? Hey. Hey man, but your here. cap's not red tonight. It's more brown. I like the hat, dude. It's that awkward moment when two guys realize that they're they have matching attire, although it's not awkward at all. Not for me. Yeah. All right, so let me bring up our last guest. Um, I met her. I mean, I met her on Facebook. I'm trying to figure out how I actually met her. I don't know if she asked me a question one day or if I saw her post something I don't even remember she can maybe remind me um, but anyway we got to talking and I said you know I'd love to have you uh, on the show uh, for this podcast so uh, let me welcome D Shroomy what's up girl hi guys hello thank you for having me so awesome I watch almost all of your podcasts <laughs> oh thank you I like your shirt thank you thank um, you I, I think I also I think Emily's got a cool mushroom dress yeah. on is that right yeah, yeah check it out. Look, I'm the loser of the group. I, I just got a black <laughs> shirt on. I don't have anything on it. Oh, well. Well, so thanks for being here. I appreciate it. Um, so uh, how about we just start off, do a quick introduction, um, how long you've been growing, what types of mushrooms you grow, and, uh, and then just real okay. quick why you're growing. Uh, let's just start with Emily. Okay, you're going to have to catch me up because my internet dropped out first. Oh, why don't you just do a quick introduction, um, how you got into growing, why you grow, and um, what you grow. Okay, so um, I had surgery back at the end of September, and during that downtime, I was like, what can I do to keep myself entertained? Um, and just kind of stumbled into mycology and kind of learning what it can do for the neuroscience side of it, mm -hmm. um, you know, what really pushed me into it above everything was my mental health. I wanted to get into it for that reason. Um, you know, I do ketamine treatments currently. Um, and the more I looked into it through New England Journal of Medicine, National Institute of Health, um, and all the other big names here in the, the science world, I started finding out more and more that mushrooms do the same thing that ketamine does mm -hmm. and so eventually you know my insurance is changing i'm going to be losing coverage for those appointments um so i want to have something as an alternative so you you had a positive experience with the ketamine therapy kind of saw the the future of some logistics here and and did your research and and pivoted and, and now you're growing mushrooms awesome. yeah basically nice all right, so how about D. Shroomy? Talk, talk us through kind of how you got into growing mushrooms and then what kinds you grow. Well, I start, I ran into a um, video on YouTube, actually, with Paul Stadman, how he was talking about mm -hmm. how um, it was so beneficial to his mother's health and stuff like that. So that took me down a, a rabbit hole, and I just became obsessed, and I kept looking it up. So I started first growing gourmets. Mm-hmm. 
And uh, as I um, kept researching, I was hearing about, like she said, the mental health stuff, because I was going through my own personal um, issues and stuff. And I was, uh, one, I heard a lot about ego death and how you can access different parts of your mind and a lot of good stuff. So I was like, Give that a shot. See, See those gourmets <laughs> started talking to you and they said, but there's more. They said, let's do more. And just, yes. Yeah. So that got me more interested. And I mean, it's just been, it's just been crazy. It's been great. That's awesome. All right. How about you, Rufus? What, what, what got you into it? I actually, you know, I know you pretty well, but I don't know if I even know the story. I, uh, I did microdosing, uh, like three or four years ago and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not for anything in particular, just uh, I, uh, my partner is a therapist and she'd heard that it, you know, kind of helped with de depression or just mood and uh, kind of made me feel more positive. Not even happy, just kind of more positive. Mm -hmm. And um, I ran out of that and I didn't feel like I needed it anymore. Like it, it kind of supported me. And then uh, not exactly depressed, but not not in the best mental state. Uh, through COVID mm -hmm. and um, it's like yeah I kind of like to support myself like that again but I don't really want to go out and source yeah. uh, mushrooms right I get it and uh, you know so I went on went on YouTube and found everybody you know you and Ed well not Ed back then but you and Willie Maiko and uh, PGT and 90 Second Mycology and Microfile Sage and yeah um just kind of dove in. Um, I haven't haven't actually done that much. I took a, a course with the Odin. They have Mycology 101 course. Oh, they, yeah. The, the course is free, but um, for 100 bucks or 150 bucks, they send you a kit with a bunch of genetics. And so I grew some, uh, you won't see them glowing in the dark, but I grew some glow in the dark uh, oh, Panstipticus nice. and yeah. uh, reishi and uh, oysters and lion's mane. And uh, a few actives as well. Awesome. All right. So you guys are all, you know, you're you're like me. It, they got you. The yeah. mushrooms got you. It's fun. Uh, how about, uh, let's hear from everybody. Um, what's been, uh, like, what's your relationship to the, the, the actual practice of cultivation? Like, did you think it was going to just be a thing that you had to learn and, you know, no big deal? Um, did you think it was like was that the exciting part was like oh I get to learn how to how to grow mushrooms or was it really more well I gotta learn how to grow them because I you know like Rufus said I you know I want to get mushrooms so I'm gonna have to learn how to grow them um, talk a little bit just about uh, what the role the cultivation has played in in your whole experience um, let's just start with Emily Oh, maybe not. She might be frozen. Okay, we'll go to D, we'll go to D Shroomy. She's coming back. All right, you back, Emily? Okay. Yeah, uh, but I totally missed all of oh, it. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> Just talk about um, what you think about cultivation. Do you enjoy the the, the cultivation process? Um, do you not enjoy it? What's your favorite parts? That just generally cultivation. Okay. Um, so yeah, I definitely thoroughly enjoy it. It's very cathartic. Um, I think prior to getting into cultivating, um, a lot of me was trying to find a sense of purpose. You know, I knew that I had to wake up, go do my job, come home, pay bills, whatever. But in means of what am I doing with myself? What am I doing for myself? And what do I see myself doing for others in the future? Um, I really. Oh, oh, froze again. She'll be back in like two seconds, just you watch. All right, well, while we're doing that, I'm going to do a quick shout-out. Thank you to Kyron Labs. Uh, he says, I love the large range of speakers you bring on. Thank you for the donation, my friend. I really appreciate it. All right, you back, girl? Emily? I'm back. All I right, don't know so what's we're... going on. I'll All have right, to, that's okay. I'll figure it out. But, um, yeah, it's very cathartic. It gives me a sense of purpose, um, and it, it just it really allows me to take the idle time, which is my worst enemy, and turn it into something productive and positive, not only for me, but something that I, pretty soon is going to be for the community as well, as I'm going to start awesome. be giving back. Nice. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. How about you, Dishrumi? 
same. Um, I want to get into being able to give back to the community and be able to do, you know, positive. Mm -hmm. For me, it has become sort of a little obsession. <laughs> I'd never guess. I didn't know you had such a badass flow hood. I mean, I can already tell you're serious. Yeah, well, it was supposed to, you know, we, I was trying to open up a business. Um, right now, that's what I stand still for now. I want to get all my ducks in a row, make sure that once I get back up and running, it goes without a hitch. But mm -hmm. Right. So that's, I, it was all my gourmets. I fell in love with my, uh, what was it, the King Blue Oyster. Oh, my God, that mm. thing. I had like this, like four pounds, my first flush. Wow. Nice. Yeah. Four I, pound I, off one block, one flush. Nice. One flush, one 10 pound block. It was crazy. Nice. And, I mean, and then I think going from going to my fruiting chamber and it takes just seven days. I was like, holy crap. I mean, the yeah. instant gratification of the growth is phenomenal. And they're just, I mean, that's just gorgeous, right? Yeah, I mean, I think people gorgeous. who have not grown mushrooms Right, I, I've talked about this before. Normally, you're just wandering in the woods, and then there it is. It's a mushroom, right? Like, no, mm -hmm. people don't generally grow mushrooms, so we as cultivators, we get to actually watch it grow, and yep. it never gets old. Yeah, my chest, my chest, uh, chestnut mushrooms, absolutely fine. And it's a oh. canopy like this. It's gorgeous. Yeah. And, I mean, for me, it's all about, you know, the whole process. I'm all over the whole process. I, I love the agar, the LC, I love the, the whole going with the trying new things with the grains. Mm -hmm. I am losing my train of thoughts here. The grain and everything else, I just love it. I think everything is great. The, then the last couple of weeks when everything is growing, it's like, oh my God, they're still growing. So That's great. awesome. All right, how about you, Rufus? Uh, cultivation, yes or no? Definitely yes. Uh, I I I didn't go into it really knowing. I uh, my my first grain bag that I set up. Um, I had watched this Willie Michael video where he was talking about you know talking positively to your mycelium right. and that you know he he did a uh, uh, an experiment and he kind of showed the outcomes. Just small experiment, but mm -hmm. I was like super into it. I was talking to my mushrooms every day, and you know just that made me really happy. You know, it's sharing love and gratitude, and I really started just feeling that myself. Um, and then it contaminated, and I was really sad. Oh. My babies died. Right. Uh, yeah. So then I was even more motivated to, you know, try again. And uh, my my office mate uh, calls the, the mushrooms the underlords because they're, like, controlling us now. Right. Um, okay. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm totally, totally controlled by the underlords at this point. All right, so uh, how about, um, so uh, everybody kind of learned slightly differently. What, what was like your, your first real mentor who, who really kind of made something click for you or was there to answer, you know, questions nobody else was answering, that sort of thing, uh, like uh, your first or most important Michael mentor? How about something like that? Uh, let's start with Emily. So initially... You know, I, I wasn't on the discords. I didn't even have Facebook at the time. Um, so like most, I was the go to Google how to grow mushrooms, you know. Um, and I think my first mentor unofficially um, would have been Munchausen, the trusted cultivator. Yeah. Um, really love him. I think he's finally moved and back to doing his live streams. Um, but he would usually do twice a week. It was like a two hour Q&A. Didn't yep. matter your level you'd come in and ask what's a grain or, you know, what's a dicarion, anything in between. And he would, he would go into detail about it. Um, and then everyone in the comments was equally as helpful. Um, yes. And so kind of like my first mentor that led to my second mentor, Michael File Sage, uh, you know, between the two of them, their videos, their information, it kind of taught me how to do mushrooms, if you will, in a right. sense of how to use spores, how to use swabs, et cetera. Um, so when it comes to swabs, I think my very first swab came from Susie when you did the High Fae Not Husbands broadcast. Mm, okay, um, cool. I ended up getting some of Prowl by the Stargazers. Um, when they showed up, I was like, oh, cool. I won these fours. I got these fours. And I was like, now oh, what, what the hell do I do with them now? Um, and so, you know, I have to kind of segue into the agar work where, 
if it weren't for P-Funk and Beaker Dabs, then I would be lost on how to do it. Um, and that just kind of sent things going forward because when I started looking around between P-Funk as well as everybody else, it's on average like $10, $15 for, you know, 10 yep. plates. And I'm like, wait, I got to send how many plates for right. just this one swab? So right, right. Um, those are kind of like the four people for me that That's whether awesome. they knew it or not, it was if I had questions, I was going to them. Um, if I was confused, I'd keep on asking over and over again. Um, and yeah, it just, it kind of graduated to now where I found your discord as well as some of the others like Penelius Jones, um, you know, dirty South, you just, the list goes on and on. Yeah. I think I'm in like 20 different discords. So. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There are a lot of discords. I can barely keep up with my own. But, uh, yes, there's something for everybody. You know, if, if you get into one and you're not feeling it, it's, don't worry. There's many others to try out. And uh, like Emily was saying, there are a lot of people in a lot of discords absolutely willing to help out and answer your questions and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. All right, D. Shroomy, how about you? Uh, important Myco mentor. Well, for me, to be honest, I mean, it was YouTube. <laughs> Yep. I that, just, me too. How do you do this? How do you do this? How do you do that? So I just Googled everything. I mean, I YouTube everything. One of the ones that did stick out was PGT. I remember going back there a lot. Um, Michael Cat, I think so too. And then I found your Facebook page. So mm -hmm. I stuck around there for a while. And um, my first Discord, I didn't even have that app. I didn't even know what I was doing. I opened it because I received your invite to it oh cool yeah and then after nice. that it was home it was game. yeah it takes a little bit to get used to it but it's a yeah. it's a good place man how to go yeah, to youtube good. like how do you use it <laughs> that's what i had to do yep cool but it worked and i'm glad it did because um most of the people that you have brought on recently are also on your discord and I'm oh yeah you can access all these people they're there yeah. Yep. I was able to directly speak with them because I have given up on the entire project because of Tritch, man. I, have, like, I yeah. was so fed up with the contamination that for about a year I didn't grow jack, like mm -hmm. nothing. So, I mean, I kept talking to everybody and everybody was like, check your grain. It has to be your grain. If everything else you're doing is good, I mean, it has to be your grain. So I switched to grain and so far so good. I did Yay. like, uh, yeah, I started doing, because I started also with my uh, gourmets. And I did maybe like 40, 50 jars, and out of all of them, I think I lost two. So, so far, nice. so good. I mean, just so you know, it doesn't matter who you are or how long you've been doing it, the, the contamination, yes, uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> it, it, it will come back sooner or later. You you might get a vacation from it for a while, but yeah. <laughs> Let me live yeah, on definitely the vacation keep you honest. a little bit. <laughs> yes. Uh, how about you, Rufus? Uh, early mentors. You know, uh, I think... The person I clicked with uh, the most on YouTube, uh, like I said, a bunch of people, but the person I clicked with most was Willie Maiko. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm on his Discord server. Um, but what? What at, yeah, at this at this point, I think it's your server, just you know, P Funk and oh, yeah. Happy Trees, and you know all the great people on on your server, and um, I'm also on Whitebeard's server. And a bunch yep. of great people on there. A lot of crossover, but um, so, yeah. That's awesome. Cool, guys. Well, uh, thank you for coming on. Uh, you know, can't wait to have you guys on in a few years once you guys are like Myco Masters. And uh, you, you, can, you can teach us all some stuff. Um, but, uh, yeah, if people want to connect with you, uh, you know, let, let me know if you want people to be able to connect with you. Uh, send me a, a way to get a, get a hold of you, you know, whether it's a social or just on Discord, and I'll be sure to get that in, in the description. Okay. Yeah. All yeah. right. Well, thank, thank you guys so much for coming. Uh, we'll, we'll do more of these. I, I like doing these. I think it's good to connect with uh, younger growers and people who, um, you know, are, are just getting their feet wet or just kind of... Like like D. Shroomy said, you know, I'm I'm at the point where it's now an obsession, so it's like you're officially in the club yeah. <laughs> with the rest of us, completely hooked. Um, anyway, yeah. All right, guys. And you're thank not in the club until you set your hair on fire using a flame inside your <laughs> SAB. 
if you don't do that, you're not uh, official. Ask yes. me how I know. That's like list. Yeah, we'll have to make a list of how you know you're officially hooked on at-home mycology. Yes. Setting your head on fire seems to be one. <laughs> that, yeah, if you haven't <laughs> burned yourself. Hi, girl. <laughs> yes. White, white beard had a camera running when he singed his whole face oh with his my SAB. Gosh. It was awesome. Yep. I was this close to setting up the camera to do it again, just so that we had it, but I looked nice. at my hair and I'm like, my salon yep. is going to be so upset yeah. to begin with, so no. Nope. Wow, so Whitebeard became Blackbeard for a day. It wasn't that bad. A little bad. singed. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. All right, guys, well, thank you so much for coming. I'll talk to you later. Thank you for having See us. Ya. Yeah. See ya. All right, let me... All right, guys, so there's some noobs. We were nice to them. Guess what? And it was it was fine. We didn't even have to be mean to them. How about that? Um, all right. So, um, so we're gonna bring up uh, the one and only Ed Grand. What's up, brother? Hello. Hey, can man. you hear me? Yeah, uh, I I'll, hear I'll go you. with the audio. Okay, cool. I forgot I, I yep. turned it off for a second. Yeah. You're yeah. Good. I, I, I'm nice to noobs too, you guys. I was a noob wow. just like a, I, I'm very look. I got a little buckwheat thing going. Um, yeah. Anybody that doesn't think I'm nice to noobs, I've, I've been just like a little comment in the chat. Y'all need to chill out because <laughs> you don't you don't know me. You want me to go all like rookie on you? You don't know me. You don't. <laughs> I need to get paid. I need yes. <laughs> Watch out, dude. Rookie mycologist is coming I'm back. Sorry, he's I'm on, sorry, man. He, he's on my team now. Yeah, man. Don't. Yeah, yeah, guys. I don't know why you're giving Ed crap. Ed's a nice guy, man. What's the like? Are you serious? I know. That, to be honest, that rookie man, he's inspired me. It's like I need to be more of an asshole, man. Like, I mean, I dude. You know what? After a couple things lately, um, one was when who was it when? Was it freaking Whitebeard who said uh, when people, um, yeah, he so he first said the thing about the biggest thing in ethics he wanted to bring up was people asking for advice and then not taking it and then still wanting more help. And then Willie Miko said the thing about, or no, I'm sorry, Nikki Miko said the thing about um, only uh, answering the question for somebody based on where they're at. So not like answering every question they have about everything, but like, what are you doing right now? Oh, you're you're going to cook grain. Okay, At, you can ask me some questions about grain. And, and that's and then, then I, I watched Rookie's live stream. Rookie came on and I was like, oh, you know what? You know, you got to sometimes manage all the questions, especially if like Ed's got a channel. I got a channel. I got a Discord. Right? At a certain point, if somebody decides... This guy might have answers to questions I have. I know people ask me questions every day, all day, constantly throughout the day. And I just, I have to at this point now be like, join the Discord. There are thousand people plus in there. And I know 400 of them can answer any of the questions you have for, for me. So it's not, I'm like, I'm not trying to be mean. But it's why I built the, it's why I, for a year, built everything up. This was the whole point, was to build a solid community and to protect it. So, yeah. That's, uh, yeah, and almost a community that can, like, sort of help each other. Yes. Because once you get past, like, three socials and you're checking these things, like, 24 hours a day, it right. becomes overwhelming. I, I mean, even I barely got a little bit of a channel, but between IG and people are talking about, oh, you should get on Twitter and this and that. I'm like, no, 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 no I can't do that. Like, Discord's cool, but it's like, you need to have a little time to yourself, too, you know? Right. Like, maybe people think that, like, because you're online, you're, you are kind of become their, like, servant almost. <laughs> it's a little, right. it's a little yes. bit much. It's a weird phenomenon that I, instant gratification, you know, yeah. like, somebody will order something, maybe, and then they want, a, like, a tracking number, like, an hour later. And if right. they don't get it, like, after two hours, they want a refund. <laughs> like, yep. Like, yeah. That's kind of crazy, man. Yep. But, but yeah, and welcome like to it. customer service and the general yeah. public. Yes. Yeah. This does happen. I used to, when I was in college, I worked at Circuit City, and I would uh, go take my break, and we would just talk about how annoying everybody was because the things they wanted made no sense. You were like, wow, did you really ask me that? Like, 
that was the most audacious. You should have seen the stuff. Dude, one time this lady, uh, I worked at Target my very first job, my first like real paycheck job. And uh, I worked the, the front customer, you know, re return section. And uh, this lady brought back this uh, comforter that was so stained and so dirty and so stinky. And she had, I don't know, she had schizophrenia and she thought she was returning a perfect brand new comforter. But I looked at her and I said, ma'am, I cannot return this. Like, and she got so indignated. What do you mean you can't return it? You guys have a 30 day return policy. I'm like, you just obliterated this thing. Uh, like, yo, you needed to figure out this, but that's what people do. They're audacious. We used, we used to have people buy paint sprayers, go paint their house, and come back like a week right. later and try yeah, to return it. Of course. It. Or yeah. like snow blowers and stuff like that. They'd use it for like a month and then try to bring it back. It was like, are you, like, are you okay? <laughs> I mean, they push their luck. Yes, everybody does, right? I mean, dude, I do it with Bezos. I just do it because he's too rich, right? So, like, I'll, I'll go to return something. I'll be like, oh, crap, I forgot the cap to something I'm returning. I don't care. Right? It's Bezos. You can do that. Oh, Bezos. they'll go in a landfill somewhere. Don't worry. They'll ship it over here, and it'll get sold secondhand. That's where I get my, like, my $1 shirts from. Nice. <laughs> I mean, I'm not in I'm not in Thailand, but I, I, I get my $5 shirts from Walmart, so. <laughs> it goes somewhere. Yeah. Oh, but yeah, that's cool man so so uh this week i think for some reason i don't know why but you know things happen uh they, they just happen i had like three or four people message me about wood lovers paralysis so mm -hmm. I, I don't know what hit the radar um but my uh I don't know either I, but something happened i don't know what it is anyway so they kept asking me about it and so I, I reached out to you. Now, my take on it was I, I'm a classic ER nurse, right? I'm pretty skeptical. I'm like, okay, you know, oh, you're, you're having chest pain. Okay, but you're playing Candy Crush on your phone. You, you're well appearing. You're answering complete sentences. You're leaning back on the, the gurney. Like nothing tells me that you're in pain, and yet you're telling me you're in 10 out of 10 pain. So I, I kind of need, things need to make sense for me. And uh, a lot of the stories about Wood Lover's paralysis were kind of all over the place. And uh, <clears throat> I thought, well, maybe there's something going on here. But there's a lot of confounding factors, right? Like, unless you really know a lot about every single person who's purported to have this, man, where to start? Alan kind of mentioned it earlier, saying, man, you know, anybody that says they know exactly what this is, is lying which is entirely true. Doesn't mean we're not going to try to talk about what it could be, what might be happening, some theories, some hypotheses. Um, so I, uh, I, I asked Ed, I said, hey, Ed, you got a pretty strong chemistry and mycology background. Uh, would you be willing to talk about this? He said, yep, yeah, let's talk about it. Um, and then I reached out to my buddy, Dr. Rick, and, you know, he's just a neurosurgeon, so if anybody's going to be able to talk about neuropharmacology and, you know, right, like paralysis definitely is going on in the brain and the spinal column, that's kind of his bread and butter, I, I thought maybe he might have something to say about it. So um, I, th I think we just got him to show up, so let me pull him on. Good. Dr. Rick, what's it. up, brother? Hey, what's going Come on, Rick? We, we need all the answers, Rick. Hey, so, Earl is I, I feel lucky we got you. You had uh, you had enough time to change out your scrubs. I like it. Uh, the uh, <laughs> I the the girls are on spring break, and so I've had the house to myself for five days nice. with the dogs. Amazing. So it's been quiet. I, I come home I, tomorrow. I <laughs> I dream of those situations, but I'm a few. I'm probably five or six years away from that ever happening. So. <laughs> five or six. Yeah, no, really now not. it's gonna be like twenty five, dude. Like, don't don't kids live at home till they're like thirty five? Oh, now? mine will not. Oh no. <laughs> well, they, they frankly speaking, up. we might not have a choice, man. Mm. Considering yeah, we right. we barely got houses at our age, or our age group, not right. even our age. 
So that's true. Chances chances are they're gonna be roomies. That could be. <laughs> your basement down there is not going to be your micro lab anymore. It's going to Spe- be. Uh, speaking of wood lover paralysis, <laughs> that's that's like uh, parenting paralysis right there. When are they going to leave? Never. Yes. Just just get an apartment outside like I did. I just yeah. That's just that's why we need to invest in land. Yes. It's true. Oh. Just, hey. have, just have open tracts of land. You yeah. can build yeah. prefabs on them. Yeah. Hippie Not commune, that I'm the man. Stock. Hippie I'm, commune, I'm, Thailand I'm 2030. It. I will Ed, do that in a heartbeat. Ed, just go buy some land. We'll we'll all move there. It'll be a big party. It, it, we'll get, I've thought we'll about it for Starlink years. Starlink receivers. Yeah. We'll get some Starlink receivers. We yes. Oh, oh, yeah. They, oh, the whole what country's wired here. It's kind of like they were talking about Ecuador, you know, because they didn't have landlines, so everything went, like, mobile, digital, like... They had to. Faster, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They just, instead of, like, laying landlines, they just made everything wireless, and there's, like, cell phone towers on every building. Like It was like direct TV was, like, done in Latin America hard before it ever even got here, yep. Yeah, they didn't waste all that money on infrastructure, (laughs) like AT&T did. The last 120 years. Yes. Good for them. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, so I don't know who wants to start with this, but uh, I'm thinking maybe Dr. Rick. Um, so, so let's just start with the term paralysis. And I have heard uh, on uh, Vice News interviewed a bunch of people. Um, I just read a, a blog post from somebody who's apparently doing some actual clinical research around this, uh, doing some sequencing to differentiate. Uh, some genomic differences between wood lover, wood lover uh, psilocybes and uh, you know non wood mm. lovers, and uh, what I have heard ranges anywhere from some facial droop or some facial weakness um, to just full blown I can't move I'm laying on the ground for five or six hours. Um, maybe yep. just let's talk a little bit about and inform people about paralysis how how it can happen how it can't be happening what could be causing those things i mean frankly speaking that's about as broad a question as like (laughs) described medicine i know know. (laughs) well we can do next week we'll do that (laughs) can you tell me how to grow mushrooms too yes (laughs) oh he can because in five minutes he can yeah ten minutes so No, I well, I, I actually have a question for you, Ed, um, with with a bit of a preamble. So, oh, but wait, I'm really when... high though, so you can. Uh, oh, you're fine. Can you explain it to me in like pothead terms? I'm really, really baked, man. So, man, <laughs> there was a thing. <laughs> so, when he started, when when Michael Geeky's, you know, like we we were talking about this what like a week or two ago we Mm -hmm. started talking about this and we so it's been in my head for this whole while and then you asked me this morning hey would you be available to come on i was like yeah sure no problem and i just decided uh right before i came on let me ask chat gpt and see what it has to offer very very interesting because there's something that I can't find on PubMed, I can't find on EBSCOhost, I can't find on just Google flat out. And this is what I want to ask you, Ed. Have you ever heard of a neurotoxin of fungal origin called uh, hypno- hypno- hypnoliformin? Formin? Um, yes. No, I saw somebody put it in the chat. That was he, me. He did. Oh, oh! I didn't know your handle there. So yep, no. I can't find this anywhere, and yet ChatGPT says this is a, a a key component of it is this potent neurotoxin that and, and it describes it as acute transient brachial neuritis, which no, because exactly what the you know folks have been describing is that. So for, for folks that are listening, acute transient brachial neuritis is something that usually happens um, usually like from a viral infection or uh, autoimmune where it affects the brachial plexus. It's this large bundle of nerves 
right underneath your collarbone on both sides. And so by definition, those nerves only innervate the shoulder girdle and the distal arms or the proximal and distal arms. But a lot of these descriptions are exactly what you were saying, where it affects the axial truncal muscles yeah. of like the quadriceps, the abdomen, the strap muscles of the back. And that's clearly not from a brachial origin. So a, what, you know, Alan said earlier, we have no freaking clue what this actually is. We can speculate a lot. Um, and that's, I think, the best we can do for now, because realistically, you know, we would need someone in the middle of an episode yeah. on EEG, taking an EMG, doing nerve conduction study. And based on those, you may need additional, like, you know, MRI, CT, something like that. You can do metabolic panels. Right. Bottom line is we have no clue. We really don't because we've never actually captured one of these in the, in, you know, in the throes of the paralytic episode. Yep. So. Yeah, now, I'm looking so, for that. I don't. I don't see it on a Google I don't search. Either. Did right? You spell it? Dude, so, did did, you, so that, what that's if exactly Chat, how it is? What if Chat GP is so smart that it's already like looking into the future? And I think it find, may have tapped into a DOD oh server. God, dude. I know for real. <laughs> yeah, you know for they, real. They pulled, yeah. they pulled it off of Usamrid. This is actually like. Classified um, neurotoxin. <laughs> you know, ten, 10 years ago when Breaking Bad came out, if you search for ricin extraction, like you would find nothing. Like ricin extraction oh. from ricin from castor bean, like you would find nothing, like literally. And I had to track down a U.S. patent from like 1932 because I was just really curious. But during the Breaking Bad where he was doing the, the stuff, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't uh, like, you couldn't find anything on it, like, on the internet. And it's a very common thing, like, ricin extraction is fairly... But, you know, um, maybe I just got this in trouble. What, what I'm wondering from the name, I'm guaranteeing that Hypnoli is the genus name for some fungus. So the, so I'm trying to... If somebody out there might be for more... Uh, it says Fusarium in, my, in some of my little searches. It's probably a genus of fungus that's probably not well known. It's probably an asexual state of a fungus. And somebody probably extracted a toxin from it. There's a lot of fungal genera that are like, I'm guessing that's the name. Uh, like, you know, like streptomycin comes from streptomyces. Like penicillin comes from penicillium. They usually name the first part of the chemical after the genus it was discovered in. So if there's another, if anybody knows if there's a genus named like, yeah, I don't know. so it's uh, Gymnopolis. Uh, I, I put it in the chat in the in Hypholoma and Salami. Mm. Could it be Hif Hifnoliformin? Maybe. I mean, that's I copied and pasted exactly what ChatGP spit out. Dude, I, I so, love that this ChatGP just absolutely is confident, isn't it? Look at it. It's just like wood lover's paralysis, WLP, also known as acute transient brachial neuritis, ATBN. I mean, dude, it's oh. I mean, it's got to be real. What if this thing just did its best and it's just way off? What if that I'm, like I'm, it just like. Right? named a new chemical well, by itself <laughs> maybe but i i love the idea that what if though what if it figured some shit out and now we I, have to figure out if it did so part of so like going back to the ricin example it's there is plenty of precedent for censorship of yeah you know certain part like essentially like you can't google the dark web all that information is still there, but you can't right. Google it because it's it's actively restricted. So I'm wondering if in their data sets for you know the uh, AI language model, they they use Tor browser and it can access yeah. everything. Dude, that is a old... great question. Mm -hmm. yeah, that is a great question. Stuff. What uh -huh. actual data can it access? Because we don't, get like a we knock don't have on the access. Door. Do, 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 do. Yeah. I know, we're about right. to get busted, guys. You just <laughs> we said, figured... you, you said hypnoliformin, and you know about ricin. 
We don't care about your mushroom farm, but oh, you you went yeah, to the wrong exactly. place. Like we don't we don't care. <laughs> we care about the, oh, oh my god, oh, I man. hope not. Oh, but I, I mean, on, honestly, if like you know, it's oh wait wait. Rufus for the win. Thank you, Rufus. Hold on, I can't pull that up. If you put that oh, in, oh good um, man. Here, I'm gonna put it in. I'll put it in the main it's, chat. It's starting to sound like the Joe Rogan experience right now. It is, but that's fine, man. It's fine. We need Duncan Trust to come on. All right, here, I'll, I'll pull this one up. All right, so oh. here's... Here but we I got think... Oh. Hypnola Foreman. No, that can't be right, though, then. Well, yeah, I, think I mean, if is speculating now, no, I mean, but are. Alan did just say there's yeah. thousands of compounds in the, you know, we don't know. Well, yeah. well, you know, I could just to like kind of maybe give people a primer if they haven't had a chance to look at these papers right here. If yeah. you want to know about like mushroom alkaloids, this is the kind of thing. But for the people that don't know, when they have these little things like R1 and R2 little, I know organic chemistry is terrifying to people. But you see this little table over here, it mm -hmm. lists these R1 and R2 groups. Basically, you've got an indole backbone here, which is also the backbone for tryptophan and indole acetic acid, lots and lots. It's serotonin. Um, and there's the basically the four and five positions. And so if you look at these, you have basically the four position, the five position on that little benzene ring. I don't know if I'm pointing the right way, you guys. I'm doing it backwards. Um, but you have the four and five position on that indole ring. Uh, and then you also have these side groups or R groups, and they could be anything from a hydrogen or a, a methyl. I'll say it like the British methyl group, methyl group, as we say it. Oh my um, you could have one Methane. or two or three of them. <laughs> so these are, yeah, methyl. This is the way all of these things, and this is why we're having trouble, because if you look over here at this list, you can have a variety of different groups um, on that R1 and that R2. And so right. it's kind of like a Lego set. You just... You basically take this backbone, the indole ring, and you kind of mix right. them up. Yeah. So that, um, you've got all your classic, um, like, magic. There you go. Yep, exactly. I'm hooking you up, Ed. Perfect, man. So that R1 and R2 you see on the right side, yep. basically you take one of those and you copy and paste it into where it says R1 at the very top and the R2. So I'm, maybe Rick can go into this more, but I'll just speak. I'll do a little chemistry. Mm -hmm. um, so at the top where that R1 group is, that's essentially the way we've illustrated the indole ring, which is those two kind of that bicyclic structure. There's a benzene ring, and on the right, there's like a five carbon that I got the N, that's a nitrogen. So where that R1 group is, that's called the four position. So if you look at something like psilocybin, it'll be four. You see psilocybin down there it says four O P D M T. Yep. What that means is a four O for oxygen and P for phosphate. So the O P is a phosphate. So where that R one is, you would have a phosphate group, and then you would have D M T, which is dimethyl tryptamine. So if you look in the right hand column where the R two, it says N, and then in parentheses C H three and a little sub two. That's right. dimethyl. So D, DMT, dimethyl, dimethyl, and then psilocybin has the, uh, the phosphor, is the phosphorylated version. Now, if you go one to the left, like counterclockwise, that's the five position. So if you look down in, in B in the little panel there, B is serotonin. See where it says 5-hydroxytryptamine? So 5-HT, right. the five is a reference to that OH or HO group there. That's hydroxytryptamine, uh, and that's... That's like organic chemistry 101 <laughs> for magic mushroom growers. <laughs> so, so that's cool. That that top chart is kind of nice though, because it has that basic yeah. siloid structure, and then with the R1 and R2 position, it shows what's there. That yeah. So you mm. kind of structurally see, like you just said, it's like Lego. So you're just plugging in, and, mm -hmm. and 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 those are all the little metabolic components of. Right. And this is this is why we have such difficulty. You can't when you extract these things. Let's just say you do a simple methanol extraction to do HPLC or whatever. You've got all of these things that are separated by such minute differences uh, in their molecular structures and they interchange and they isomerize and they go back and forth. And and then down at the bottom in panel D there, the part on D, you've actually, believe it or not, that's the explanation for why mushrooms turn blue. 
Right. So it says chromophoric oligomers, uh, oligomers, or however you want to say it. Um, that's why mushrooms stain blue. <laughs> Believe it or not, that that uh, oligomeric thing down there where it's kind of got the little brackets, um, those are basically little silicon molecules that have attached themselves and polymerized. And that's why our mushrooms turn blue. And that's why we don't really want to bruise them. And bluing is kind of not really a good right. like indica yes. indication so, of how so strong that, they are. So that molecule at the bottom in D. So the idea there is you have roughly that siloid structure has found a way to connect in a much more complicated manner, making a polymer uh, of that core structure, basically. Exactly. 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 And then you got the beta carbolines in there, uh, the, the C, the little C box. Those are where things, if you look at that, it also has an indole ring. The indole ring is that sort of the thing you see in serotonin. If you want or tryptophan, you guys know the amino acid tryptophan. These are all based on tryptophan, which is a common amino acid in all of our grains. So a lot of times people, when they talk about supplementing and stuff, they want to increase the tryptophan levels in our grain. Completely unnecessary. Right. Um, because you don't, there's a lot of tryptophan. Uh, whole grains have protein in them, and proteins, by their nature, have tryptophan in them. So we don't need to supplement our grains. But, you know, opinions vary. <laughs> so now, okay, so to go back to what Rick was talking about a little bit earlier. Um, so well, he and actually, I talked. Oh, can you, you go back? See that? I just want to mention something real yeah, quick. So on the, on the physiologic side the pharmacology side i'm sure some people were wondering like what the hell is the importance of r1 right. and r2 groups so just side chains in general we can just call r groups side chains they hugely affect not only obviously the structure of the molecule but more importantly the function um, so different r groups different side chains are going to affect what receptors they can go into it's going to affect absorption rates it's going to affect penetration of the blood brain barrier um, because it's it's not only the size of the actual molecule more importantly a lot of times it's the ph and the and the polarity of the molecule oh, right. so that's why there's so much going just in any field there's so much going into drug discovery uh, because if we look at thalidomide, you know, it was uh, the, what is it, the R isomer is the one that's, uh, or stereoisomer is the yeah. R means right-handed. Uh, that was the one that was giving uh, fetuses uh, flippers, yeah. like actual flippers for hands. And if it was just the mirror image of the exact same molecule, it was a great drug for morning sickness or pregnant women. And so I, I just, that, that's always a classic example of just how important it is for stereochemistry. And one tiny little thing or seemingly tiny little change can turn a, an innocuous drug into, hey, this is making mutant fetuses. Yeah, yeah, exactly. On a slightly other side note, too, before we this is the basis for Tykal. The book that Alexander mm -hmm. Shulgin yep. wrote, mm -hmm. all of this stuff you guys are looking at is in this book, T-I-H-K-A-L. It's on Arrowhead. This is the basis for the book that was written, what, 35, 40 years ago? And this is why a lot of the pharmaceutical companies would probably hate Alexander Shulgin if he was still alive. Because he basically gave us the recipes for all of these things so they can't patent them. <laughs> so this is, again, not new stuff. But like, but like Rick was saying, that little tiny, I saw, you flip, you take one of those methyl groups and you just literally flip it over and you've completely changed the physiological effects, the neurological effects, whatever, and, and simple things. I mean, you put a methyl group where there used to be a hydrogen, you're talking about a whole different series mm -hmm. of, uh, of chemical compounds. And one more thing, these things are ubiquitous in nature. If we get to talking about the, sort, the psilocybin paper in nature, these things are ubiquitous in nature. You know, indole acetic acid for the cannabis growers, you know, IBA, indole butyric acid, IAA, IBA. These are PGR, plant growth hormone regulators. They are ubiquitous. These things occur exactly the same molecules occur in plants, algae, cyanobacteria, frogs, humans. So trying to, 
like figure out like how exactly these things evolved and how they affect our brain to be honest could be completely like kind of like uh collateral like these things are so important for life in general that like how they affect us and because they make us trip might not even really matter to be honest it could be like a side effect you know it could just literally be like hey you know all of life on earth is based around these types of molecules so the fact Mm -hmm. that it makes us trip and our egocentricity as humans like is the silver lining yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Yes, for sure, for sure. But it also being narcissistic, egotistical humans that we are, right. we think, oh, this is a chemical for us. Right. Yeah. No. No. It's a well, chemical yeah, for Well, yeah, like Doctor Rick was talking me. about. Uh, <laughs> you know, they're called nicotinic receptors. They're called cannabinoid receptors. Yeah. They're, you know, we we uh, so, the, the we ascribe those. Have nicotine. Yeah, we ascribe those things to all these just based on how we've framed them. The researchers have framed them in their minds. and and then No, but I have cannabinoid receptors. I should use them. Yes. Like they were given. I should use them all the time. Yeah. Now, I imagine all those, the R1 and the R2 side chains, all these sites, you know, like you were saying, whether it's uh, polarity, whether it's size... I imagine it can also potentially confirm to the the docking site differently. Like, who knows? And I I don't... I imagine there's a lot of science that has to occur before we even remotely understand some of that stuff. But somebody's got to start doing it. I mean, something... Well, well, look at the SSRIs. They've They've been researching them for 40, 50 years, and that's a whole other topic. But we don't even understand really how serotonin affects our brains. The mm. predominant, between dopamine and serotonin and a few other ones, the predominant chemical that makes us happy, sad, hallucinate, audiovisual stuff, we don't even understand that. Right. And that's been being researched, like, intensely for, like, 50 years, and we still don't have a clue about that. It's like, wow. So so trying to figure out how some New Zealand guy gets, you know, couch lock or whatever after he ate some subarugin essence. We might have trouble with that, man. <laughs> I don't, I, I, truthfully, I don't think that it really has anything to do with, at, at least based on the scant information that we have presented, I don't think it has anything to do with geographic location or even species it sounds okay. like because especially if you go back to pick from the same patch they're they're at different times there are a much mm-hmm. higher likelihood of having the reaction so i think that more mean or points to the substrate was there a chemical additive in the mulch that it grew in that, mm, or that was my first know, guess too that was my first yeah, guess. Or, or is it like, are, are these patches near, like downstream from farmland? And it's yes. chem runoff from farmland. Uh, we don't know that. Yeah, um, exactly. Oh, yeah. I mean, dude, it, it, if it's by a patch, someone could have s- dropped a battery there and it could have spilled. Like, who knows what chemical could have been contaminated. Yeah, been like, oh, they've all been just the cobalt. Right. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Yesterday here, they just lost an X, a cesium one thirty seven like little capsule exactly. that was in some X ray yeah. machine. The, it got like little, recycled. Like, wow. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, they, it's it, somewhere it in Bangkok. In no, somewhere it happened in, Bang- in the U.S. They had to shut down like a highway in Montana or somewhere. Yeah. And it was it was a fit like the size of a thimble, yeah, but it can feed highly radioactive the... material. And like. Yeah, it could be something as innocuous as that. Um, based on, again, based on the scant descriptions that we've got, though, and Ed, I'd love your input on this. It, I, I don't think that, because like, so we we were originally talking about. I, I think this kind of sounds like my senior gravis, where, you know, it, when the per like, the descriptions that I've seen where some of these folks feel like okay, if they've gone past the peak of their episode and then they try to use those muscles again, like I try to hold a doorknob or I try to get up and it instantly goes back to peak intensity. So that's where initially I was thinking, hey, maybe this is more like a, not not in the 
not in the origin. Like, I don't think it's autoimmune by any means. Right. But maybe but it's, it's working at that way. the nicotine receptor, exactly. Like maybe it's inhibiting, you know, acetylcholine esterase. But then I started thinking more about how this could be more like a sodium or potassium uh, channel blockade. Or you know some you know something like with uh, botulinum toxin, where it's just holding open the sodium channel, and then you get essentially spastic paralysis. We don't even have an accurate description of what type of paralysis is this: flaccid paralysis, spastic paralysis. We're just yeah, like you said, that. if you can't see it, it's pretty hard to assess it. This is the problem with exactly. the whole trip report thing is, um, you know, they're, they're kind of anecdotal, even when there was ice. I watched that thing by the, the two Australian guys that was quite they did pretty extensive surveys. And I mean, they summarized them, but you got to realize these are usually post experience. Beck. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I forgot their names. I think so. Yeah. Simon Beck and Kane, something else. But they're, these are all like after the experience and their memories. I mean, who hasn't, like, been on, like, five grams and been like, I'm going to write all this down and so I can remember all this insightful stuff. And then you read it the next day and you're like, oh, that's garbage. So if you're asking somebody about their experience during a WLP and they're trying to give you a, a, a anecdotal report, like, six months after it happened and they don't remember where they picked the mushrooms, they don't know how many they took. They don't know what other substances they, they were on. They don't. You don't know anything about their genetic or right. past history. This is not the way like research is done. It's it, it's mm -hmm. it's. I mean, it's it's nice information, but I don't know if we need to really be making huge. Like, here's the one thing: don't scare people in the Pacific Northwest off of cyanescence. Yeah. Right. And this is what we talked about: the bill in Oregon. They're limiting their medicine to cubensis. And I've got a sneaking suspicion. I'm a bit a little bit of a conspiracy theorist, you know. They're trying to they're trying to get people off the cyanescens and the azuricins because they want them to be afraid. If you eat azuricins and not the cubes that we sell you at the pharmacy dispensary, however they're gonna frame it, you might get WLP. You don't want that. Buy our cubes. Mm. Like don't grow yet the same thing, you know. There's been this with the scares with marijuana over the years paraquat oh, no, weed. Jesus yeah Christ. don't don't buy your weed off the street because no it used to be paraquat oh don't buy your weed yep, off the yep. street they sprayed it with paraquat and you'll yep. get lung damage and because and then it just goes on and on and on and on and on so they want i'm one little theory is that maybe they want to scare people back to their medicine because that's what they're going to make money off of i don't want to be all like paranoid but before we move <clears throat> wow. on can i mention one thing like rick said is the you guys, if for the foragers out there, don't eat mushrooms that grow near golf courses, parking lots, yeah. Walmart drainage ditches. Uh, basically, you're talking about lead. It used to be lead. Heavy metals. I had a huge patch of Caprinus comatus, uh, shaggy manes, that I couldn't eat. I would walk at U of M. Remember on North Campus, the back parking lot? There was a oh, huge, yeah. there was a huge, 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 like, full hill of, of shaggy manes that I could not eat. Because it was clearly, um, like, text, you know, landscape graphs. You know, wood chips, eucalyptus. In, in New Zealand, uh, eucalyptus and the whole tannin kind of oh, thing. Yeah. I heard something about that. It could be related to various um, polyphenols, like the tannins, polysaccharides, that we just don't know about. Um, so if you're growing, like, uh, chicken of the woods. Don't eat chicken of the woods off conifers. You know, the orange Lidoporus sulfureus. Like, people know, don't eat that mushroom off right. of conifers. It tastes bad, and it could make you sick a little bit, stomach ache. This is well known. If you're a mushroom hunter, you learn the substrates, the trees. Like, so basically, wood chips, uh, you don't really want to eat, like, bluets. I used to harvest bluets around the U of M campus. And if you get bluets off of, like, you know, treated lumber chips, like it's a house that's been turned into wood chips and then used for mm. mulch. And then you go and get like brominated polyphenols in your mushrooms. Like that's not good. You don't want to eat fire retardants. <laughs> no, but you can't you blame don't. It tastes weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can't, but you can't blame it on the mushrooms, right? It's yeah, like, no. I don't know. I feel like people are looking again for like maybe some sort of like uh, uh, a villain. 
And I don't know if the villains really like the mushrooms. Maybe my brain is controlled by fungus, it's so just, maybe it's the vessel. Protect the mushrooms. Protect the mushrooms. <laughs> yes. No, but Defend I mean, on, honestly, it's it's quite literally doing what it's designed in terms of its exophytic right. metabolism. Yeah. So if it's growing on something, you can't really blame it. You got to blame the substrate because yeah. it's, it's quite literally only producing what it's taking in. I would, yeah, and I think that study even that I, they had like an hour and a half long uh, YouTube on it. I uh, they never really said any certain things about the substrate. It was always just like we don't know where they got it from. So if some guy mm -hmm. got it in the drainage ditch behind a gas station next to the eucalyptus bark, <laughs> you know, like that a little it had Patrick, this I mean, like rainbow scheme. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was like all shiny and. Oh. <laughs> That means it's good. <laughs> Maybe it, one of, it was one of like Paul's like bioremediation product pro projects. <laughs> He's like, hey, like don't eat those mushrooms either, you guys. Uh, yeah. Heavy metals, lead, all that kind of stuff, not good for you. I think it would wow. be really interesting to see what bioremediation results look like from like near Chernobyl. Yeah, I hear this a lot, you guys. Can we put this to rest right now since we got two doctors here? You guys, mushrooms don't eat radiation. They absorb yeah, no, it. They no. don't degrade it. Right. Cesium-137, strontium, whatever, 70, I can't remember what isotope. They don't, they absorb radiation. The mushroom will become radioactive. Like, right. radiation is not going to be, like, big aromatic you, compounds. You can grow the radiation. Yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah, it would be a bad idea to eat Chernobyl mushrooms. You know, they used to, um, in fact, there was reports... That would be a good movie, movie, though, Rick. Yeah, exactly. There's a, <laughs> now, there's there's a realistic movie, not, oh. this, dumb cordis, not this cordyceps. I got shit. connections, that's, that's guys. Bullshit. I might have to pitch that one. Dude, let's do well, it. there was people be, getting sick We'll, we'll be the scientists rain. that get eaten in the open uh, five minutes. <laughs> 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 no, the CIA will come, like... like get us because we just divulged this to truth you know yeah. you're talking the about rain. toxins and rice and, God, and now yeah, radioactive we... mushrooms yeah you dude you got demonetized like 20 minutes ago sorry about that <laughs> <laughs> so can i just say like mf <laughs> yes. uh but now people did get sick from eating reindeer meat they were getting sick from radiation poisoning like right. five years after chernobyl people in like Scandinavia were getting radiation poisoning from eating deer that were eating the mushrooms and that it was bioaccumulating in and then people were actually getting like radiation poisoning from eating deer meat or reindeer or whatever whatever they called up there um that's a real thing like that really happened mm -hmm. wow. um so you had these like radioactive deer that nobody wanted to eat anymore and it was creating a problem because they were like selling this meat and like and the salmon also after Fukushima the salmon right. off of Jacosi, right. Japan, yeah. you know, that these are all heavy metals. Those radioactive isotopes are all like heavy metals and they absorb and, and they don't, they don't degrade. Well, that's, like that's, they don't that's get what I'd be interested to see. That's what I'd be interesting to see on like a heavy metal test on some of these, uh, any of the plant or fungal life is to see what the heavy metal accumulation Man. looks like. I know. Maybe they got like a super fun site in New Zealand that we don't know about, and these dudes are like picking their right. subs off of the, off of the well, so tailings of that. <laughs> does, doesn't New Zealand have like a crazy uh, concentration of uh, bunkers? Because like all all the ooh. super rich are like building oh, their bunkers. Uh oh, there. uh oh, man, dude, I'm, I'm expecting that knock on the door any this second. This is like four <laughs> movie pitches right here. <laughs> dude, where's my bug out bag? Where's my spores? <laughs> man. All right, man. I got my spores. I'm out. See ya. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Get literally, him. my there's my bug out bag. I don't got a bag. Oh I got two boxes. Oh bug God, out. <laughs> the world's ending. What do you have? Mescaline. Yeah, that, yeah, that's like I got more spores than the ATCC, man. I got. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that American type culture collection for you. For you. The, 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 the Spore Depository, the, the culture depository for America and most of the world. Ed, Ed knows how to make a joke really land is by, like, explaining it with three sentences. <laughs> I know, yes. I'm sorry, dude. 
It's okay. I didn't know what the ATCC is, you know? Like, I didn't know what it was. Like, NCBI, I didn't know what that was. Yeah. Well, I, I didn't know what, like, what's LG, man? I got something named LG. Is that Lang? For what? Long, long Ghost, Lang, the who knows? That's what I thought, Long Ghost or Lang. I don't know. I got something labeled LG, and I still I don't know what it is. That Ape Reaver. Oh, Lucid Gate. Oh, Lucid there you go. Shout out to James Cruz. Oh, yeah, could yeah, be yeah, yeah. Gates. Word. Okay, oh, thanks. PG, Pearly Gates, LG, yeah. Lucid Gates. Ah, okay, I would have figured, yeah, I should have figured that out. You know, I was looking at it thinking like, yeah, a I got AEG, PG, and then I should have figured that out. Yep, Lucid Gates, thank you. There you go. Amy. That's next on the list. I got a bag of spawn <laughs> sitting right there. That's awesome. It's <sighs> oh, a lot to okay, keep okay. up with. I know, dude, it's it, it is, really. It's a lot to really... keep up with. And like a, Ed, like you always remind me at the end of the day, they're all Cubensis. I know. Yeah. That's it. Well, you know, it goes back to the whole TAT story. I could take probably one of those prints and potentially make all the cultigens. You know, give me forty-five Again. years. Yep. I mean, yeah. What was the other thing we were gonna talk? Oh, I don't even know if we want to get into that. I'll let you lead. Yeah. The discussion. Oh no. Go. Go for it. Well. Yeah. I don't care. Uh, well, well, Rick might know about this, about the Psy H. Somebody, uh, I believe it, I don't know who was talking about it. Um, this Psy, Psy it, it was on that, it was on that. Um, what I learned what about Woodlover's Paralysis um, yeah, at what, the 2022 oh, the, uh, Entheogen the Conference. Enzymes. Yeah, one of the other papers where they have the whole metabolic pathway and all the different enzymes that do the, like, phosphorylation, dephosphorylation, Oh, that was, that was my, that was in my, uh, one of the slides of the presentation. Yeah, 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 oh, yeah, yeah. That was a. Uh... Oh, and you also had that slide with all the different serotonin subtypes. Like that's another big, big yes. story. There's not just like we talk about the five like HT2A receptor mostly, but there's like what seven other uh -huh. subtypes. Yes, and the the big thing I I I failed to mention this, but this is this is definitely one of the uh, one of the things that. Uh, I guarantee the DEA is using to push back on any fledgling legislation. So, if you think back to FenFen, remember that it was pulled off the market because uh, folks were being diagnosed with valvulopathies. Yeah, yeah. That one. There you go. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, and so, for folks, it's it's uh, what. What the second Fen was doing was essentially tearing up heart valves. That's what we would generally term as valvulopathy. But what they discovered was that it was exerting or it was manifesting this complication through stimulation of the 2B receptor. Well, if you look at that uh, binding affinity chart, the 2B receptor or psilocybin, psilocin, has much better, I think, like what sevenfold, better seven times, uh, yeah, sevenfold more binding affinity to the two B receptor than the two A receptor. So guaranteed that at the very least you're gonna get like a black label, uh, black label warning on anything that's FDA approved as a breakthrough therapy. It'll have that black label warning on it. May cause valvulopathies, stimulation right. of the two B receptor. Oh gosh, they're trying. Labels. You know, I, the other thing I remember they the the deuterated compounds, like they're gonna put mm -hmm. deuterium instead of hydrogen in some of them to make them basically patentable, so they can take psilocybin, which is obviously not patentable, and put a deuterium in it, like a heavy a heavy hydrogen. It's called deuterium, like the one that's got an extra. Well, it's got mm -hmm. like one neutron. Um, is heavier, so they that becomes patentable. If you just take one of wow. those little hydrogens on any right. of those molecules and you put a deuterium at one of the positions, yeah. it, it becomes patentable. Patentable. So yeah, they got all and kinds of tricks, do, right? They'll they'll issue patents on two things for a single molecule. They'll issue it on the molecule itself, and then on the process by which process. you yeah. deteriorize mm -hmm. that compound. So they'll get yeah. covered on both of them. And realistically, so that's, that's essentially how the 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 companies are approaching patents. Um, well, I think mm -hmm. I think was the compass that that said like 
no, but how we are synthesizing our psilocybin is different. We're like, well, prove it. Of course. They go, well, that's proprietary technology. I can't just work. <laughs> but Company but you're applying for a patent for it. You're, um, it, it's the, um, who, who did uh, Epidialect? Who's, who's the company? It wasn't, not Gilead. Um, it's, it's a UK company. But anyway, they actually applied for a patent for all cannabinoids. Uh, I think you told me about this. All cannabinoids. Right, like... Discovered and <laughs> undiscovered. Um, that is crazy. Luckily, man. the U.S. The patent crazy. office came back. They're like, you, 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 "Are you smoking these while you're writing?" Like, they no, probably were. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the audacity of these people! But that's they got to try, I guess, right? You know, they got to try. Well, exactly. I mean, because uh, you you can do it a hundred times. All you need is one to go through. Right. Realistically, mm -hmm. right. You're just hoping you catch them at the wrong time. Yeah, just catch just, them sleeping. Let, yeah. let one slip by. That's it. I know. It's like me signing all these documents at work that are written in Thai language. It's like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> it's just like yeah. signing 20 pages. Yeah, I need a new work permit. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> I think that was my firstborn child, and that was my house, and that was my car. <laughs> All right, quick shout out! Thanks, Chiron Labs. Really appreciate the support, brother. They they love the content. I do too. I'm 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 loving hearing about all this stuff. Um, I know. Uh, I mean, somebody's gonna get patents on something for sure. They're, we're we're not gonna stop any of that stuff. No. Uh, it, it, as long as. Uh, as long as we don't, you know, Ed's got enough spores to keep us going for a while. Uh, <laughs> I, I think we'll always be able to grow mushrooms. Um, this is why I had to start selling spores, because I'm like, what the hell am I going to do with all these spores? Like, I can't, I can only run so many cultigens. And I'm not, like, bragging or anything, but as you guys get into this, you start, you you're like, many. I'll make, yeah, like you saw, I just picked up, like, right here, it's like, three spore prints like there's three spore prints that's like 50 million spores like yeah. i can only run i only need two of them for each to you know right. new isolate that is like a lifetime supply of spores right there and then of course you get curious about other ones and blah 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 and then you start buying these plastic boxes and they start piling up yep. <laughs> shoot man all uh. you know what i use because i don't because uh, i gotta scale everything down now so i don't do um let me see if I can do this one. I'll try. So the lids from my old uh, 32 quart stair lights are now. Oh, there they all go. Oh, that's there they good are. Idea. Oh, but yeah, and I use I use the lids. It works great. That's okay. I dude, I don't even cut them up into little things anymore. I just fold the whole thing over and just for for a rainy day. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it could be. Somebody said they pulled out some weird old cultigen that was like 15 years old. They found some like spore print wedged in a book that they, it was like the old like magic mushroom growers nice. guide and they found some print, like it was like a homestead PE or something like from like 25 years ago. Maybe it might grow. Yeah, who knows? Hey, man, this is what I'm going to leave my children. It's, they're going to, when I die, they're going to read the will and it's going to be like, but who gets a spore print collection? <laughs> Like, what the fuck? Yeah, <laughs> no, seriously, it'd be like those baseball card binders, you know. Yeah. Like I, I probably I had some like rookie like um Reggie, what was that guy? Ricky Anderson for the A's. Sure. They were like worth like 150 bucks, and of course my mom Ricky like Anderson. threw them away. Yeah, Ricky, yeah. I think, and like he was uh he was worth a that card was worth a lot, and um yeah, basically my mom threw it away, and it's like oh yeah, that happens all the time, right? Comic books and baseball yeah. cards but hopefully not spore prints but maybe it was a get... usb drive with like ah yeah the, the, the bit the bitcoin crypto bitcoin code on it. Dear <laughs> Lord. yeah hey man uh, so my my old bitcoin story i ran a recording studio in detroit and uh my rate was 35 bucks an hour and i had a guy one day try to pay me with bitcoin and he gave me the whole pitch and i was like no, I need money, dude. This that sounds stupid. He he offered me ten. Bitcoin. 
He offered me 10 Bitcoin for, for like three hours, three or four hours of work. Oh my so, God. So yeah, I'm pretty sad I said no to that. Now what I do so I can actually go to sleep at night is I just tell myself there's no, I would, no way I would have hung on to it forever. I probably would have sold it. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's like, oh, I had a chance to invest in Apple in 1976. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Oh, but those, shit. there's all those stories though. It's crazy. Uh, somebody, I, somebody made a, Comment. I just saw Ed touch his head. <laughs> Someone made some comment about your alfalfa thing, <laughs> and I just oh, saw yeah. you touch it. Coward. Yeah, I forgot how. Yeah, guys, you know, I just you guys washed, forget. I just Ed just hair. woke up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And he I washed my hair up. last night. You know. Congratulations, I, I wanted to look, I wanted to look nice. I even, but look at that. I shaved, man. Look, I don't, wow. I gotta, I, Nice. I can look nice for the mushrooms. Yeah, yeah man. I had to see Rick's Lucky. He's not in the hospital anymore. I had to go get fit tested, so I had to thin mine out. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, nope. no fun. I, oh, God. I remember failing oh, yeah. that fit test and getting that spray in my mouth. And... Of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, thank not God. Fun. <laughs> yeah, man. It's it really sad. Is. You know, I saw yesterday. That I, that I went to residency with and uh, mm -hmm. he over the course of residency he just like kept growing his beard and then covid hit and then everyone he was at nyu everybody had to shave everything yeah. it was one of those like oh god put it back <laughs> yep yeah. how how did covid just on every level the mm -hmm. only good thing that came out of COVID is a resurgence in growing cubensis. Yeah, so yeah. Well, this kind of related to something I heard yesterday on a podcast about how all these, like, field trip and all these, like, huge companies that open clinics for, like, ketamine are now, like, going under. Oh, really? Because, I mean, Rick might know about this. The, I think they jumped in a little bit too early, and a lot of people were like dumping millions and millions and millions of dollars into these clinics wow. and i think like people got they wanted it to be the next cannabis but as we know it's probably not going to go exactly the same way mm -hmm. but these companies now these startups i guess you might call them they were trying to ride that cannabis wave i think and it's just not going to happen that way so I don't know, maybe Rick might have something to say about that. What do you think about maybe the future of, not, not necessarily legalization, because obviously I don't give a shit about that, but <laughs> but, but the, 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 basically the utilization of our, our, our medicine. Like by the general population, do you feel that like people are becoming more acceptable? You know, I live in Thailand, so I'm a little bit out of the loop. And I live like pretty much in my own little bubble by myself, like with my mushrooms, you know, and and um, it's it's like I'm I'm curious because what happens in America generally happens here five years later. So if maybe if what happens in the U.S. happens here, I can get in on it a little early <laughs> like, well, because not because not because I want to be rich. I just want to, you know, you know, help the community. <laughs> if you can take advantage Caregiving. of it. Mm -mm. Is, the, is it going to, in the U.S., is it going to become decrimmed, or what, is there a future for psychedelic medicine in the U.S.? So, yes and no. Um, first off, on the whole criminalization versus legalization, I think that most, most folks that have a, a an actually good understanding of public health outcomes and studying trends in other countries, decriminalization is by far the way to go. Um, I think at the very least it, so the, the whole, the whole point of decriminalization is that it really starts treating drug, uh, drug use as a mental health issue and not a criminal issue right and that's that's realistically why it has worked in those countries as far as legalization the prospect of legalization in the united states i think it's absolutely possible here especially when you look at it from the capitalistic point of view because realistically even if 
So let's let's say operating on pure rose colored glasses, uh, MDMA and psilocybin get breakthrough, uh, breakthrough drug, you know, status through the FDA. Even though it's approved, it's still going to cost, you know, $15,000 at least. At least. Realistically, it's going to be like 30000 Epidiolex, which is just CBD isolate, is $60,000. Right. Like, come on. And then they go, oh, well, if we get it legalized, then, you know, we can get covered by insurance. What insurance is going to cover that? Honestly. Right. None. So, again, even though we legalize it, it's still not going to help the average person. It also goes to the fact that, okay, so let's say that it gets approved by every insurance carrier. That still leaves tens of millions of people in this country that don't have health insurance. And most of those people are the ones that would largely benefit from this type of therapy. Right. So it's not, it's, this, this is why, like, in the cannabis industry, the, you know, black and gray markets persist and thrive in the face of legalization efforts. That's exactly what's going to happen here, regardless. Because you can't tell someone you have to do it this way through a doctor for 30 grand. Screw it. I can grow more than that right. for 25 bucks. I can buy it, not even grow it. I can buy it for 25 bucks. Yeah. Right. Okay, Why that's it. I so so that? this this is in the spirit, I think, of Alexander Shulgin and many other people that went um, along with him, is that we need to make this medicine available to any grandma, any yeah. person, like, living yeah. in a, a, a subsidized housing. Like, you can literally set up a mushroom farm and supply yourself and everybody else with medicine for a couple hundred bucks. And the ROI is not bad. So I was, I was chuckling a little bit. That's exactly yeah, yeah, what yeah. We, we did yeah, with exactly. cannabis, and you yep. know, starting in the north, in the northwest. Sorry, I can't think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. That's exactly it. You get patients to grow for other patients, and then you reimburse them for their time, for their materials. Exactly. Everybody wins. Right. But you that's know, what I was gonna that's say. Difficult. That, that's what that's. I, I was chuckling because that's what uh. That's what gray market people call customers. <laughs> like that. Yeah. But, you know, yeah, caregiver. I love the word caregiver when it came out a few years ago. It's like, oh, yeah, I think yeah, I'm a caregiver. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a candy coated way of saying, you know what? But uh, but yeah, that's it. Co-ops where you've got people that come together, maybe in a common lab and you've got like, you know, maybe a really, really nice hood. You know, you get an eight foot wide hood. You can have two, three people yeah. working at right. it and put and and that's what i think like decrim will be awesome if i i think they could even like maybe in oakland they kind of sort of do it already where they have common lab spaces and it could be sequencing equipment you know not everybody needs a freaking gel electrophoresis kit you know not everybody you like pipettes you buy like you know a 500 hundred dollar set of pipettes like everybody can use them you know hopefully they don't mm -hmm. get a miscalibrated drop them or anything but yeah, this is awesome, and I think um, maybe um, that's the way it will go Day because one, a lot they're all gone. Mm -hmm. Day yeah, one, they're all I, gone. I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now you put them on tethers like the pens at the bank, you know. Well, you know when people <laughs> used to go to the does. bank, the little chain <laughs> on the pen. <laughs> like ah, I need, I can't load my gel. Ah, ah, ah. Now it's like those things at Best Buy when you when you go to show your your wife the the new phone and then it disconnects and the whole store goes off that's what it would have to be Wait, they got here dude, it's funny and i saw some video where a guy tried to steal a mobile phone out of some store in india and like the whole shelf collapsed on him and it was just like quite funny yeah, yeah this i want to that's to be honest the con okay we need to remember this stuff rick you guys all you people out there we're starting a commune free drugs i know how to make wine the man, the, are you too? Yo, you just you gotta buy the land, man. Well, well, I, I promise I you, if you, if you make the invitation, you'd be surprised how many people start showing up over there. I think we can host oh, the full okay. moon parties. I, yeah, I know. I, I, I have, yes, I've got some really bad <laughs> things coming in, my, but yeah, it'd be fun. It'd be fun. Yeah, there's a lot of amenities uh, this country can provide. 
For but, sure. Yeah. But then, you know, some people don't like to wash dishes. So I lived in co-ops before for in Ann Arbor. I, I lived in co-ops for like five years. I know how it all works out. People don't like to clean bathrooms and wash dishes, you know. So, yeah, yeah it's a bit it's a bit tedious. But now these co-ops where like I think really like where you have uh, shared lab equipment. I don't know if people would become a little more open about I, I understand there's a paranoia. Like, I would love, love, love to bring people into my lab and, like, show them exactly what I do on a, on a daily basis. But I can't because, like Rick's saying, they're likely to steal stuff. Right. Like, I hate to say it, but they'll, they'll steal stuff. And I, don't, I can't let people know where I do my stuff, you know, because they'll come rob me. We're mm -hmm. unfortunately right. in a world, this happened with cannabis, too. I mean, I hate to bring up the dark side of this, but... You, you get people that, uh, you know, have, have goals in life, and their goal is to rob other people. So if you set up, like, collectives and cooperatives or if somebody where it knows where your grow is or something, uh, you'll get robbed. You know, it's, it's just, like, the simple facts. Kind of sucks, but um, so, yeah, we'd have to come up with some sort of system that I don't know how that would work out. Just do what, like they do in Denver, man. I, last time I was in Denver, you'd be like, oh, look, a, just a completely innocuous, boring warehouse with four armed guards out in front of it. <laughs> like, I wonder what's in there. You turn yeah. one corner, it's just like an industrial road, and you'd have no idea, right? It's not like a dispensary. There's not like a little green square or cross or anything. It's just industrial buildings, but you're like, okay, I'll smell something. That building right. and, has an odd number of yeah. security cameras. And, yeah, and then you're like, oh yeah, the the barbed wire fence, security cameras, armed gates, and like literally, you will frequently see somebody with a very large semi-automatic weapon. And you're like, okay, I know where I'm at now. I know what's going on in there. I saw mm -hmm. one a guy had his operations set up on the top of a parking garage, like a 10-story parking garage, mm. and there was he basically rented the whole garage, and he was moving like kilos, like tens, wow. hundreds of kilos, and he was doing it all on the very, very tippy top of this parking garage, so there was like no escape, basically, right. except for off the side or down the right. parking garage, and yeah, that's, uh, uh, I don't think we'd have to be that paranoid, that's but... Nice. But well, you see, know, that's, we that's what's great. Everybody. If everybody grows it themselves. Yeah. So I already saw this in Detroit. They've, you know, uh, there's a lot of decriminalized areas in, in Michigan at this point. And uh, supply goes up, cost goes down. So whether you're buying it or, or, or growing them yourself, uh, a lot more people are have access to, to the stuff. Sure. You know, that's what I thought would happen here with cannabis, because I, I live in a place where cannabis uh, is completely legal. There's literally four dispensaries across the street from me that have hundreds of varieties and the prices haven't went down that much. And I think it's the same thing that happened in the U.S. You know what goes up the the marketing and the you guys we're, we're getting in like oh, somebody sure. was talking earlier about we're getting into this era where like people buy things based on the name and the picture they see on instagram oh, yeah. and yeah. we all know that like there's not that much difference in the in the cultigens or the varieties and that we're getting to the point now where i don't even people like taylor yates he made that book which is awesome um but like you said he's gonna have to update it in a year sure. or probably next week <laughs> um, tomorrow and yeah yeah and and this is it's getting to the point where people don't even understand where these things came from and they surely right. don't know the differences and then we don't even have hplc testing down right we don't have the standards and i while well, no, we were mentioning no. the other day and i don't know if you want to the integrity of the people doing the testing right. they're selling a service and that service is to give you a 35 percent thc the guys here First thing they do, they walk into the shop, they look at the menu, the little glass jars, and they say, which one's the highest THC? And that's 90% of the time the one they buy. And then the, the, wee, the bartender will be like, oh, well, smell this, smell this, smell that. By the time you get to your sixth strain, it all smells like weed. Oh, diesel, oh, that one's a little bit sour. Oh, that one smells like minty. But then by about the seventh, 
strain. You can't figure out your terp profiles. And you ask the guys, like, well, like, how much limonene does it have it? They're like, what the fuck is limonene? You know, like, <laughs> what the fuck are you talking about? I only know about THC and CBD, and they don't even know what the different, like, THCs are. Like, what about THCG or CBD, whatever? And they're just like, what the fuck are you talking about? It's THC. That's the number. That's the high number. You should buy that. And that's the right. one that's more expensive. And, I mean, come on. I've smoked a lot of weed in my life, contrary to, like, we've... <laughs> I know you have your preferences too, but come on. I don't know. I can guarantee with a double blind sample of 30 different kinds of weed. Like when they do at the cannabis cups, like after you've smoked your fifth bong hit, are you really a good judge of like that weed's like flavor profile? And like, <laughs> I mean, come on, man. After your fifth rip on the bowl <laughs> like, or bong, like, are you really, really a good judge of like, like I don't know. So, I don't know, again, it, it's... I'm pretty bougie where, about it, but, you know. But but do I, but that's the thing. Do you know those numbers are real? And is this, like, a perceived thing? Like, if it says it's 35% THC, you think you're going to get higher, right? Like, I don't know. I think a lot of it's a lot of placebo so effect. I really, I, really do. Not, so, it, it's, not, it's not placebo. It's what, unfortunately, but most folks don't understand especially on the corporate side is that if you like if you really want to get your bang for your money you have to get heavy with turkeys not spray on mm. and that's the whole thing is if so the entourage effect really won't take effect until you hit about one and a half two percent terpene content and so, like, here in Florida, the medical dispensary, uh, True Leaf, they are known for pumping out tons of cannabis, but almost all of their cannabis terpene content clocks in at 0.8. So at that point, you are entirely reliant on THC content for any sort of effect. The thing is, oh. anyone that has, you know, smoked or ingested just THC, will tell you that it's dog shit. It's a terrible experience. Because, yes, I'm high, but I don't know if I feel good. I don't know if I feel anxious. I don't know if I feel sleepy. Mm. I just feel like I need to walk around because I have too much jittery energy. But then you turn the corner and you get something with like a 55 or 6% uh, terpene content. Those are the one. Those are the flowers that you can hit the ten percent THC, twelve percent THC, and you'd be like, "Holy shit! I have never felt like this before." It's terpene content. We did, we did, we did fantastic experiments where we blinded uh, the test subjects, and then we asked them to uh, estimate the THC content of the flower that they were smoking. It had zero THC content, and we just varied the levels of mercy. <laughs> and so you'd be like, oh, this, is, this has got to be like 40%. This is like 20%, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Exactly. And you go, really? Open your eyes and stand up. Are you high? And they go, yeah, we're not high. But yeah, because you didn't get any THC. You got mercy. Wow. No mm. shit. It's like, yeah, I can produce that That's effect. It. Their primary the selling point content. here is this, yeah. So that's the way people judge the weed here is basically how it smells, like 100%. Yeah. And they see the THC content if it smells good. And I, I hate to say it, they might spray it with something. Like there's some of that, they'll there's... open that little glass jar and it's so strong, like that diesel smell, that gassy smell. It's yeah. like, I don't think that's weed. Like I've grown weed. I've smoked a lot of weed. That doesn't smell like weed. It smells like some chemical. And that... It's not beyond people remember to spray stuff with like fentanyl. Yes. Like they're they're spraying shit with like Ooh. deadly opioids. You think it's beyond them to spray a little like uh, mercine or limonene in there? Hell no, they'll well, spray so it that, for sure. That is actually a unfortunately a more commonly occurring phenomenon out uh, coming out of especially Southeast Asia. Um, and the, the way that you can, so it, essentially it's usually old dry cannabis 
that has lost, you know, almost all of its terpene potency, and so they'll mm. spray it, and you get that effect where you open it, and it almost like knocks you back because it's so strong. Yeah. And they're essentially just relying on you. Going, yeah, that's that gas smell, and then they'll close it up exactly. real quick. If you leave it out, that smell evaporates very quickly. exactly. Exactly. You could tell that they'll ram it into your nose real quick and then quickly and then close it, it back up because they know. That's the thing. Even if you have good weed sitting around, the smell very slowly kind of decreases, but it mm -hmm. doesn't just go away. Like you, I've, I've had like decent weed. You said, I mean, if you got it, you know, sealed up like two years later, it still smells pretty good. Yeah. But like you said, brick weed that you've destroyed all the trichomes and it's oxidized. You need to like juice it up a little bit. You know, believe it or not, I've had people here have dried fungus, and to make it heavier, they hit it with a spray of water. Because that extra half gram, gram, that's another 10 bucks in their pocket. Wow. It's crazy. Yeah. These people are unscrupulous. They will do... I mean, remember who we're dealing with? I mean, mm -hmm. some people have a history, you know, and they've, you know, maybe done other things that aren't so humanitarian. Yeah. <laughs> No, realistically, that's that's one hundred percent right. The FYI, if you are ever suspicious of anything that you buy, uh, just just take a small nug, crush it up with your hand, put it in, put it on a paper plate, and then hit it with some water. Uh, Non-sprayed cannabis should have a very faint purple hue to the water that runs off of it. The sprayed stuff will look like Kool-Aid. Uh. So it's like really dark, real heavy, and you like it, especially if you put them side by side. You're like, oh, holy crap! I was about to smoke that. Well, see, that's what I thought. Everybody would start growing their own stuff here to get around that problem. That's why I originally started growing mushrooms, just like a lot of the uh, some people were saying earlier. The 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 new growers there were saying that you know you can't trust stuff you get off the street. Um, and that was the reason why I started growing like 30 years ago because I'm like I don't trust these dealers. Like this 30 years ago, you know, and when people now, you know, you start hearing people say like, oh, I got acid, man, that ain't LSD 25. No right. way. Like LSD yeah, 25 like is way. Th DMT. Yeah. Or, or it's even one of the substituted phenethylamines. There's like in the Pico group, there's like 2CB and all those like n bomb and all those things. They're they're very, very cheaply made, basically meth. They're variations mm -hmm. on meth. And they cook that shit up down in Mexico and send it in somebody's ass across the border. You got like a half million doses, a 2CB or whatever. And those chemists, they've read Pykel and Tykel too. <laughs> right. They know exactly how to tweak, man. Like, you know, you put a fluorine on there instead of a hydrogen. And now you've got a pat. I mean, things like Prozac, if you look at it. It's a generic nope. looking molecule that's got a fluorine stuck to it. And it's it's that's what chemists do, and that's how they make the big bucks. And that's believe it or not, Mexican chemists know how to do that too. Like oh, yeah. you know, it's not that hard. Um, so yeah, it's, it's all over the place. But I thought the homegrown movement here would really take off, but it's not, because as we all know, like people are kind of inherently lazy a little bit. Yeah, exactly. So I. It's we got to get past that like laziness thing. Like people will spend thousands of dollars on bud, but they won't buy like a grow light. Right. <laughs> like I just kind of wonder or the people that grow uh, like the people that won't spend 150 bucks on a pressure cooker, but they'll spend like $400 a week on other recreational substances. That's yeah. I talk to people yep. all the time I'm about like, that. What? Like, come on. You got $150. I know. They'll you go out do. to the bar and, and buy, you know, 15 Budweiser's and spend the same amount, but they won't buy a pressure cooker. That The ROI on that is literally, like, infinite. <laughs> like, like, as many man hours or woman hours you have, you can make as much return on your investment. That, that $150 pressure cooker can pay for itself a thousand times. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, you just got to become a caregiver. Yeah. My uh, my buddy Kaz makes a good point. People don't grow their food either. And boy, oh boy, yeah, man. I might cook one, one, one dinner a week. Uh, other than that, you know, yep, I'm, I'm Blue bad. Apron, we're going out, we're, yeah. So if, if I'm not cooking my own dinners that night, um, it's it gets a lot easier to, you know, we're too busy. Everybody's working. 
That's why I kind of like the whole thing that's happened with LC and the pre pre-made bags. I mean, I'm kind yeah. of a purist, you know. I'm like I'm old school, you know. I had to I had to get spores and shit, you know, right. from the back of high times. But like I really like the LC thing that's happening because it it provides people a really sort of convenient fast yeah. entry. And I know once they get that first grow and they realize like what just happened, there's like a light that goes mm-hmm. off. Yeah, it's just like, oh my god. Like, I think I'm a mushroom grower now. Yeah. <laughs> and then it's, you're like, I don't really need these kids in this this room. Like, you got to move your shit out of there, honey. Right. Like, yeah. like I need that that's room. That's what happens when you grow anything. It's, I think, it's, yeah. It sucks and until you get that first one. You're like, oh, I actually can do that. It's, it, you know, running a four-minute mile. It was, it was thought right. that people would have heart attacks and shit themselves trying to do it. And then when someone actually did it, they go, oh, my God, it's possible. Right. So. I will definitely grow <laughs> mushrooms before I run a four-minute mile, though. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't do that at my peak, man. Uh, I ran a five. I ran cross-country, and my first mile splits were usually, like, five minutes, eight seconds, or five minutes, ten seconds. It's pretty, that's Trust me, that felt like I was just it, about sprinting. It was pretty fast. So I uh, four yeah. minutes is super fast. I was never close to that ever. Yeah, uh, ice hockey I think made I'm... full impact. <laughs> yeah, you're yeah, but you're you were doing well, plenty of not low impact up here. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty. So how do we how do we get all these uh, like newcomer? One of the things I wanna just I don't know if you're gonna end it here or but we have to encourage people to be resilient. Like, yeah, don't give yes. up. We were talking about contamination a few weeks ago. You guys, you will get contamination. I'm right. literally going to go right now and throw away two shoeboxes uh, if the police don't knock on my door first <laughs> or the CIA. But I'm going to go, like, throw away things that just didn't work out. Like, I've right. got some multi-spore things. They just didn't work out, and they're starting to smell, and they're st- I saw fruit fly. I'm going to get rid of them, you guys. you got to be persistent. Um, don't give up if you have a bad grow or you get trick or whatever man people that grow like years and years and years you will get contamination it just mm-hmm. is inevitable the seasons change maybe the weather's wrong you've got a bad batch of quar you know bad batch of grain you forgot to set the timer on the pc the list goes on and on and on right. and on um don't give up you guys don't give up um, this is the kind of thing you have to persist and be resilient and uh, just like most things in life, you know, you got to be resilient. And and this will become a way of life for some people. It's not just like, it's like almost like a philosophical movement, I think, at this point. Um, whether you take I the agree. medicine, you give it to your friends, or whether you're just like a dorky scientist, you know, like you can use this medicine and help the people around you. And this is really, I, I mean, I get support from strange people like that they're out there these people are they were hiding like me in the woodwork like he said you meet people at work michael you you know you might meet people at the mcdonald's like line there are people out there that need help and we need to get past this um this sort of moral stigma or whatever the hell you want to call it this is this is not a bad thing that we're doing and 10 years from I now agree. 20 years Look at what has happened to cannabis. 15 years ago, cannabis was like the devil's lettuce. And it still mm-hmm. is to some people. Here, I see people smoking constantly, all day, every day. Nobody cares at Nobody all. Cares. It's it's a plant, and we're dealing with fungus, and it's a freaking mushroom. You know, like, let's get over it. <laughs> I like it. And if not, we'll, we'll start the, you know, the, the, the psychiatric treatment center, and we'll go. You can come sit on the beach in Thailand, and we'll, like, smoke weed and play in the water together. I'm, 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 I'm just waiting. to do that anyway. Yeah, yeah I'm ready. <laughs> let's do it. That's what they do, man. This this place has turned into a... It was, it was fun before. Dad's vacation it's too, beautiful. you know. Yes. <laughs> I know. Cool, guys. All right, well, we had a couple other things, but you guys got super deep on, uh, on what we did talk about, so I, I, I think mission accomplished... Uh, I think uh, uh, there was a lot of good oh, yeah. feedback in, in the chat, and uh, I definitely learned something. <clears throat> anyway, I will link some of these articles that, that came up uh, tonight in, in the description, probably sometime tomorrow. 
Uh, I'm getting ready to go on spring break here with my family, so I gotta finish making seven sterilizers. Uh, I gotta knock up some some grain uh, last day before we go, and then you know jump on a plane. So I got a bunch of stuff to do, but I'll, I'll try to get all that stuff up uh, in the next day or two. Um, anyway, it was fun, and, and yes, just like just mm -hmm. like Alan Rockefeller said, we didn't figure anything out um, uh, about wood lovers. <laughs> <coughs> he was right, but. Three we, more podcasts. We, we'll get it figured yeah, out. Yeah, but we didn't. I know. <laughs> I mean, I think we. I, yeah. I, I know. I. It's still interesting to talk about. Um, I would love to hunt down some of these people. If, if you have ever experienced that, yeah. reached out to me. Um, I'd love to know. I, I know this guy. Um, the things I learned at Ethno Fest 2022. He interviewed 10 or 15 people who claimed to have experienced it. Um, I think that's really the secret of getting any further at this point is actually doing a much better uh, canvassing of details about these people. So We'll see. Maybe, maybe we'll revisit a little bit later. Maybe we can find some of these people and have them on and get, get a more detailed... A description of, as Ed says, the thing they're never going to describe <laughs> properly anyway because they were too damn high to describe it. <laughs> Dude, I can go outside. It's about noon. I can go outside and like get like five potheads and bring them in and have them describe the uh, the, the different cannabis strains. <laughs> we won't. We'll do that one night. We'll do that. Yeah. yeah. No, I'll be sitting on my bed over here and be like, "Hey, man, that new blue diesel is the bomb, man." Yeah. Dude, every time I see on Instagram, I get this one. This I don't know what it is, but it's some guy that's telling knock knock jokes to some pretty Thailand girl, some pr or Thai girl, and uh, Thailand girl, and uh, you know it's so dumb. But I, I'll, every time I see one of these, I just think to myself, I'm gonna see Ed walking by her in the background or something. <laughs> I, one of these days I'm good. I'm gonna be. Oh my God, he's right there. No, there's so many yeah. white people here. It's funny. You walk around certain parts of Bangkok and you're like, where are all the Thai people? Like, where did they go? That's like, so they're all but the people selling noodles and stuff. They they're there they're for the tourists basically. But out where I live, it's like more Thai people. But it, like Sukhumvit, this main drag downtown, man, it's like white people and like kind of the wow. sort of Middle Eastern people and. You wouldn't think it was Thailand. It's very strange. Like, you'll be like, where, where? And if you go to the beaches here, you'll just see a bunch of, like, Europeans, like, half naked hmm. and, like, high. So it's, it depends on what beach you go to. But the full moon parties, they're kind of, like, epic. And they're epically, like, kind of not that great. Because hmm. imagine being in, like, a British bar with, like, 50 drunk British guys trying to, like, hit yeah. on your girlfriend. Right. Like, that's kind of what it is. <laughs> like, it's like, yeah. Nice. That's why we need to throw our own. Well, yeah, we're 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 just waiting for Ed to open up his resort. Maybe. Yeah. Yep. Somebody said it should be called Ed Grandland. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna write that down. There you go. Write that down. Put that on a post-it note. Nah. All right, guys. All right. Uh, so uh, next week I am gone, but thanks to modern technology and uh, a little chat GPT. Um, we will have some episodes. They're in the can. They're they're being uploaded as we speak. And uh, nine o'clock Monday night, uh, it will air. It will be uh, directly through YouTube. So we'll see how that goes. If it goes well, maybe that's where. Maybe I won't even need uh, Streamyard anymore. We'll see. Uh, so it, it, if Monday night comes around nine p.m. and it doesn't load up, uh, it's because probably have a technical difficulty, and I'll, I'll try to get it fixed and get it up for you guys. Anyway, uh, thank you very much for sticking around. Thanks to Dr. Rick. Thanks to Ed. Uh, thanks to all my newbies and uh, Mandy and Alan down in Ecuador. Uh, thanks for being on, and we'll see you guys next week. Bye. Guys. I'm going to do it. I Bye. Safe. Bye. Oh, yeah. You got it. That Wow, you can do an impersonation of her pretty well, I heard well, somebody dude. doing it yesterday. Oh, was that Mandy? Oh. Nice. I, was, I just saw it on a movie the other day. No, oh, you're. I thought you're doing the impersonation of that little Thai girl I told you about. Oh no. <laughs> no. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well, quite... you did that without even meaning to, dude. Everybody probably it's on TikTok, man. Everybody's yeah. doing the same thing on TikTok. Exactly. 
All right, guys, take care. Uh, I'm, I'm going to hit you up with a little uh, Patreon action here.